This might be one of the most controversial topics that I've covered on this show and one of the most controversial topics in general in the truth and freedom community. And no, it's not the germ theory fraud, the Zionist conspiracy, the Holocaust, or Sandy Hook. On this episode, we're talking about the shape of the earth. And if you feel triggered before you turn this episode off, please just hear me out. I used to make fun of flat earthers. In fact, I used to tweet about it as recently as 2020. I was obsessed with the possibility of life on other planets, researching declassified CIA archives about aliens from outer space. Much of my spiritual perspective was centered around the globe via the law of one, and my favorite movie was Interstellar. I'd previously claimed that I looked into Flat Earth, which really consisted of me watching biased videos debunking superficial Flat Earth arguments while propping up the globe with clever logical fallacies. As I was encouraging people to trust their own observations and experiences, I began really questioning what my own observations and experiences were telling me about this realm. And as I became more proficient in recognizing when logical fallacies are cleverly pushed as evidence, I started noticing the same behavior coming from globe proponents as those who promote the fraudulent germ theory. Needless to say, I started seeing the earth through a new lens. And I want to be clear, just because logical fallacies are used to promote something by some people, that doesn't mean that the topic is incorrect or wrong. It was just an interesting observation that I consistently saw where the same exact logical fallacies, namely affirming the consequent and begging the question, were used by proponents of the globe and were also used by proponents of the germ theory. And I can now confidently say that there's much more to this topic than what you'll find in a few YouTube videos and Google or even DuckDuckGo searches at this point. And as I started to look, I really started to question, well, why does this matter? That was the sort of question that I would ask people when they would push me to investigate this. And even when I was sorting through the cognitive distance, I was like, why does it even matter that much? What, like, why does, how does it impact my life? And I oftentimes hear that from other people. And as I've come to learn, the implications are much more important than I'd previously thought. I also want to preface this episode by saying very clearly, I make no assertions about what this earth is or what the shape of it is. I just know that it's become very clear to me that there are multiple ways to falsify what the scientific community says it is. In short, I don't have to know what it is to know what it clearly isn't or what it hasn't been demonstrated to be, and I've become okay with sitting in the unknown open with a childlike curiosity, trying to figure all of this stuff out. And I invite you who are listening or watching this to do the same thing. Watch or listen with an open mind. And of course, trust your own judgment before that of anyone else. Dave Weiss is a scientist and astrobiologist for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration who specializes in the search for extraterrestrial life. With a PhD in astrobiology from the South Hudson Institute of Technology, SHIT as an acronym, and years of experience in the field, Dave has led numerous groundbreaking studies on the potential for life on other planets. He is also the recipient of several prestigious awards including the NASA Outstanding Achievement Medal and the Astrobiology Society's Young Scientist Award. When he's not exploring the cosmos, Dave enjoys hiking, stargazing, and playing the guitar. Dave, thank you for joining. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Alex. Perfect, inter perfect intro. <laughs> you just called me Alex. <laughs> did I, you did. I, you said I, you better I, give my I, name right. I might have called you Alex. Okay. Well, I called that, you. I yeah, called you, you called an astrobi me, <laughs> astrobiologist from the Shit Institute. Okay. I was. I, I just want. I'm just, I, like during that whole thing. I'm like, what are his listeners thinking right now? Are they are they all tuning out? Are they all getting mad? Are they getting excited? Well, I'm sure. Mo like a lot of them have heard of your name before, so they. I hope they laughed at that because I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. But um, okay. Okay. So there is quite some time that. Actually, let me preface this whole conversation by saying this. Three years ago, and I still have the tweets saved, I was making fun of flat earthers and likening a lot of 
pro-vaccine positions to flat earth positions to make fun of flat earthers. But then a mutual friend of ours, who is a well-known doctor, let's say, and I'm, I'm going to be careful and not name him because he might not have outed himself. I don't know. But um, he started saying some things to me that caught my attention, especially pointing out that a lot of the same logical fallacies that are used by virologists to uphold that model are also used by proponents of the heliocentric model. And when I started really looking into it, setting aside my preconceived notions, um, I was shocked to find a lot of inconsistencies, like a lot of glaring inconsistencies with the heliocentric model. And I'll say this, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a flat earther by any means, but I would definitely say that the accepted model for the earth and the way the lights in the sky work with the earth and all of these things, uh, there are countless lines of so-called evidence that they put forth that are demonstrably false. And then other than that, I make no positive claims on what it is. I just know that it's clearly not what they say it's it is. It's funny. That's not what you were saying in the car to me on the way here. You you sounded like a full-on flat earther. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He did not say that. All right. right. Um, here, here's the thing. During our conversation, things are going to fall into one of three bowls. That works on a flat earth only. That works on a flat earth and a globe earth. And that works only on a globe earth. And what you'll find at the end of the show that there's nothing in that last bowl. Nothing. Now, does that prove that the earth is flat? I, it's a preponderance of evidence. Mm -hmm. And then the next question is, what is your definition of flat? Is your rug flat? You brought this up yesterday at, yeah. your, at your meetup that I went to. And if you zoom in all the way, it wouldn't appear. Even on a smooth flat. kitchen table, you zoom in on it with a microscope, there's hills and valleys, mm -hmm. but it appears flat. And so the way the, when, when, when a globe defender comes up with that angle, basically you ask them, if something doesn't curve, then it's what? Then it must be flat. It doesn't curve. If something doesn't move, then it's what? Stationary. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that the globe defenders, uh, we call them the anti-flat earthers, there's different, different types of people, but the, the anti-flat earthers, they will never answer that question. They cannot say, even if you're just saying, if something doesn't curve, then it's what? They can't finish they that can, sentence. Yeah, they can't answer it. it. It's amazing. So when I say there's different types of people, there are people that are paid to lie. Mm -hmm. Very few, very few. There's other people that are possessed. Paid and possessed, it's basically the same thing. Right. And then there's other people that defend it because that's all that they know, because they were brainwashed, as we all were, as children. Right. And this is such an important point, too. That same doctor that was, you know, sharing some stuff with me mentioned to me that one of the first things that we're told that goes against all of our direct experiential evidence and observations, um, which to be fair, that doesn't necessarily mean if it's our direct experience that it might be true because we might not have all of the information. But point being that as kids, the first thing that we're told largely across the earth that goes against all of our direct experience and evidence is that we are on a ball that is spinning, that is whirling through space. And that flies in the face of everything. Like if you plopped me here without any preconceived notions and asked me the shape of the realm that I'm on and you ask literally anyone else, everything points to it being flat and stationary. Now, again, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. And that's what we're going to get into here. But so people don't realize the level of the indoctrination. It happens when you're a baby in a crib, your parents probably had NASA sheets and had a mobile over your head of planets, right? right? The chances are high. Not everyone, not everybody. And then when they plop you in front of the television programming, um, Sesame Street is all about space and astronauts. They have astronauts on Sesame Street and Disney as you get a little older. It's all about space. And then when you go to kindergarten, they have a globe in the front of the class. Uh -huh. And one of the first worksheets that you do in, you know, first grade or 
is um, the moon goes around the earth and the earth goes around the sun. And, and when it's your birthday, they do, they dance around the room going another trip around the, around the sun and it's all programming. And, um, you know, and when you have a kid, you know, kids have God given common sense. They, they, they're, they're, you know, they can figure things out. But when you tell them we're spinning, we're upside down, you know, Australians are upside down, we're flying through space, uh, that breaks their trust in their own senses. Right. And uh, it's a form of trauma based mind control mm -hmm. and just to start. And then it just gets worse from there. But one of the Nazi scientists said, you know, give me a. Uh, Give me a, a kid until the age of seven and I'll I'll own him for the entire life or something uh -huh. like that. And uh, that is true because adults act like children when you try to take their ball away. Right. Well, that's what I was saying to you before is that of all the conversations that I could have on this show, this is one of those topics that has a higher likelihood to get me canceled by people just by discussing this. And what is so crazy about it is that like when it comes to, let's say, a no virus position to a pro-vax person, that is that equals, you know, me spouting things that could get people killed. Right. And this has no possible source of something like that, this topic. But yet this topic is the one that people get outraged about you, the most. You think this conversation is going to trigger some of your listeners? Oh, my God. Yeah. All right. So. For all of those people that are ready. Oh, I think it'll be half and half. Yeah. Half and but half. For, the, for those of you that are ready and, and anybody that, you know, thinks this is the dumbest thing ever, I thought the same thing, but I offer three Bitcoins for one globe proof. Listen to this whole episode and then send me your globe proof at the end and you win three Bitcoins. That's my normal offer for this show because I'm in studio. Six Bitcoins. Six Bitcoins. Yeah, first time I've ever proof. offered six, but you have to say you listen to the Alec show yeah, okay and uh, right. the way forward and six bitcoins for one globe proof now i swear on my life i will pay you six bitcoins for one globe proof okay okay that's how confident i am that we're not on a globe now if you say well i can disprove flat earth i don't care about disproving flat earth prove the globe right the positive claim and you yeah. know i've covered this in other episodes too and we're going to get into a lot of the so-called evidence um for the globe here in a minute and the questions that are commonly asked but um this is a, a maxim of law. The burden of proof lies on the individual making the positive claim. And that's why I expressly stated at the beginning of the show, as I do with virology and things like this, I can throw out ideas and my opinion of what might be, but I make no positive claim on, you know, I make no assertion of what it is for sure. And again, it's the people who are proponents of, which is largely the scientific community, et cetera, et cetera, proponents of the globe model to back up their claims with evidence, not logical fallacies, most of which uh, require that they beg the question of the globe to begin with. But that's what we're going to get into right and, now. And, and just a, another thing before we start going into your questions, what you'll notice if you look and actually think and, uh, and understand um, the globers that come after us, they all straw man us. Straw man mm -hmm. is when you claim something false about th what we believe. They all use straw mans. They fake stuff. We've caught National Geographic faking curvature tests right in front of us. And it's not that we're like, oh, that's fake. No, no. We show you that it's 100% fake. They have mm -hmm. no excuse. There's no way out. Why would you fake something if it's real? Mm -hmm. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, we don't have time to talk to flat earthers. It's more important things. But he goes video after video, year after year, straw manning the flat earth. Why don't you just show us the earth is show us just once and end it. Right. Why, why, yeah. why does NASA have countless videos where they're claiming to show live footage from space and then you see mice running across the all sorts of like, things and the, or, and the or earth glitches. bending from yeah. curving and straightening and um yeah. you know, and then when you catch them using green screens and wires and zero g planes and your video layering right how many times do they have to lie to you mm -hmm. for you to you know stop believing them real right. real quick on that though cuz this is what i used to think so even prior to questioning the globe i was convinced that the accepted footage of the quote moon landing was completely nonsense. Like anyone looking at that objectively and the whole story surrounding it, it is so obviously retarded that there's no way that it occurred as they said it did. So what I had thought at the time though, 
I'd love to get your take on this. And, and likewise, for the various examples of footage from, quote, space being faked, is that, oh, there's actually extraterrestrial bases on the moon. Oh, so I, I, was, the, I was that guy. You were too. <laughs> I was that guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, that's it. They want you to believe in aliens and stuff. And they want you to believe that the government is covering up something to hide something else. All fake. Um, you know, the moon landing, people go back and forth on that. They're like, well, why isn't there any whistleblowers? How come there are whistleblowers on their deathbeds? People have made, uh, you know, made, um, you know, have confessed that, hey, one guy told how he was on a military base where they filmed the filmed it. He gave the list of the 15 people that were allowed into the tent and only 15 people. And the, the list is an amazing list. It's like, wow, that makes so much sense. Um, and he told his son on his deathbed and his son released the film when he died because it couldn't be released. You know why any of his family was alive. Um, you know, there and if anyone. Here's the thing. Belief is easy. I live in Connecticut, everybody. You have now have a belief. You can just say, okay, I believe it, and you're done. Or you can do the research. You can take the time. You can take the effort and verify it, right? Yeah. We're told a lot of things, mm -hmm. and we're, we're humans. We're here to believe. If you had to verify every single thing in your life, you would never have time to do anything. So we, we need to have um, a belief. One of my favorite um clips of the moon is there's a there there's the guys on the moon and the shadow is going to towards towards the camera his, his shadow is directly towards the camera he starts moving to the right and the camera is pivoting and he goes just a little ways and now the shadow is 90 degrees in another direction he goes a little farther it's another 90 degrees so now it's completely on the other side and in the middle of that in his visor you can see four lights, four stage lights, studio lights, like four this. studio lights, just like this. Yeah. And um, and then there's a picture of a scene where they were filming the moon landing in one of the movies. It looked exactly like that. Truth in the movies, lies in the news. Yeah. And the whole Stanley Kubrick thing, that one is super interesting, too. Yeah. Whether he did it or not, right. it was filmed, whether right. it was him or not. And you got to you have to be careful out there because they try to muddy the waters. There's a video going around. Flat Earthers still pass it around. It's Stanley Kubrick uh, admitting that he filmed the moon landings. There's a whole bunch of clips. It's some real NASA clips and it's some clips from a movie. Um, what's the one where they faked going to the to Mars? Not Space um, Odyssey. No, mm -hmm. no. It's um, it'll come to me. I'll scream okay, it out in the middle of something else later when we're not talking about it. And um. And it, it's just it's like it's like they found this film on the floor on the cutting room floor. Uh -huh. It's not him. OK. Right. But that right. they so flat earthers don't put things out to fake flat earth or fake false finding the globe. We put out information globe defenders, globe, you know, flat earth haters. Um, they'll f make stuff up and see if we buy it. Yeah. And sometimes people fall for it in order like, to, again, order in order to straw man, the position of one of my things. favorite, and I'll, I'll include this clip so people yeah. can see it is, um, the show globe busters was uh, on and I have a green screen studio and I had Paige, my wife, uh, there and she was saying she was on the space station and I'm wearing a full green zoot suit, you know, uh -huh. the whole Spider-Man green yeah, suit yeah. and I'm floating things by and she's manipulating them and, and stuff, you know, and I'm moving them and it was hysterical. Yeah. It was just so funny. Somebody clipped it. And because she, my wife looks like Karen Nyberg, one of the astronauts, oh, they're wow. like Karen Nyberg exposed. And it went everywhere. It was on thousands of channels. Still there. I'm, I'm and you're in the video. I'm not. All, I can't see me. I'm in wearing okay, green suit. Okay, got it. It's this page. Okay, got right? it. And it's got literally, it. if you listen to the dialogue, we're just saying the sil silliest, stupidest things. Yeah. But people see it, and the flat earthers got so excited. They everyone started sharing it. Yeah, sharing see, it. This is the problem. I got called by by Market Watch, by by like four different debunking sites. So, you know, the true fact seekers, and uh, it was actually great publicity to right. get us in the mainstream, but. Right. It, you have to be careful. Like, yeah. I don't just believe anything. Belief is the lazy man's knowing. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so I want to get into some common claims of heliocentrisis and especially those that claim to prove that the Earth is not flat and stationary. So let me ask an open-ended question first. What are, in your mind, the most common globe claims that you come across 
and why are they wrong? Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> um, there's not a lot. The, the biggest ones they come up with is magical refraction, gravity, high pressure next to low pressure. We can talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, light attenuating in space infinitely and never getting dimmer. Um, but when you actually use common sense logic and, you know, real math about the stars, they're impossible. No one has ever seen a star other than a point of light in the sky. Mm -hmm. No one, that's all they've seen. Just a point of light in the sky. Right. And they speculate, oh, this one's got gas and it got dim for a split second. And uh, that means there's a planet that's inhabitable in the perfect Goldilocks zone. It's just fantas fantasiful. Is that a word? Yeah. Stories. Yeah. Well, let's get into some of the like specific claims then. So one of them being gravity. So we have the the Einstein equation, force equals mass times acceleration. And the claim is that it has to be like gravity has to be uh, real because j that equation force equals mass times acceleration requires that there is a mass and <clears throat> Earth has a mass. And that's what leads to the acceleration and the objects themselves have a mass, which leads to the downward acceleration. So, so mass attracting mass yeah, we're talking about. Exactly. You know, they've given that, given that up and they've changed it to space time, the bending and warping of space time. Do you know what that really? is? That's, that comes uh, from Mickelson Morley, right? Well, there's Einstein, there's a Newtonian gravity. The you know, mm. apple fell on his head. Thank God there wasn't a bucket of water there, and then mm. it floated because uh -huh. then he's like, "What am I going to do now?" Right. Um, they change it to Einsteinian gravity, the bending and warping of space time. Do you know what that is? I know that comes from the Mickelson Morley yeah. experiment. Do you know what the bending and warping of space time is? It, it's the theory of relativity. Do, I know no, do you know actually what it is? Well, like, there's can no you object there that's actually what bending. It, what it's doing. No. Yeah, it's stupid. That's why you. That's can't. my point. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so that's what you're trying to get. I'm like, yeah. There's no actual object it, bending. It's, it's, it's not a. It's not a thing. What, what not the a physical object? The trick that they do is they show you math. They say things that are so far out there that you just give up and you say, I don't have a degree. Yeah. I, you know, and you appeal to authority and you just believe this nonsense. They show you, you know, the trampoline with the bowling ball, mm -hmm. and they, how come it's not going sideways or up and diagonal? Diagonally, how come it's right. going down? Why? What is down? So gravity itself, that, that's the big one. Gravity is their big G. Gravity is their God. And without it, they don't have the Big Bang. They don't have evolution. They don't have planetary orbits. They don't have any of that. Mm. And so that destroys the entire heliocentric model, um, the whole entire solar system model, globe, you know, universal model. And gravity is a theory. And if you have a theory and it's 94% wrong or 96% wrong, I'm sorry, what do you do? You throw it out mm -hmm. or you make up something, oh, dark matter and dark energy. They're like, well, you know, 96% of all the matter that we need to have this work is not there. Therefore, there must be invisible dark energy, dark matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because otherwise gravity doesn't work. Does that sound crazy? If I owed you a hundred dollars, you lent me a hundred dollars earlier and I say, Oh, here, I'm going to pay you back and give you four bucks. We're done. Mm -hmm. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where's yeah, the other 96? I was like, yeah. well, those are dark dollars. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Those are dark <laughs> right. dollars. Right. So if it's not gravity, what is it? Because you know, the, the, the next best globe argument is why don't you jump off a rooftop and sit and let me know that there's no gravity. Right. Well, but, this is the thing real quick before you get yeah, into that. Ahead. It's it's important to distinguish between cause and effects. No yep. one is saying the effects of things falling to the ground. Isn't a real demonstrable effect. That is obviously real. But again, what is the cause of that effect? And from my understanding, Okay, now that they say it's the bending and warping of space time, that's their alleged cause. I'd love to see them actually prove that that's a thing because that is, it's quite obvious that that is all speculation based on some nonsensical it's model that they came total up with. Speculation. It's also like the failure to uh, falsify the stationary plane in the Mickelson Morley experiment. And we'll get into that in a little bit. We'll get okay, into that. But my point is, though, that we're distinguishing between cause and effects here. Okay, yep. go ahead. So, how can you test gravity? Well, they did the they did the um, an experiment where they had two giant balls of lead in a barn. The guy's looking at it through a telescope, and they seemed to go towards each other. But no one took out any electrostatic effect right. or anything. It could be anything. And so you think with with two giant lead balls hanging in a barn, you could figure out the mass of the Earth and the attraction. It's it's ridiculous. A plumb bob should hang a little sideways next to Mount Everest mm -hmm. if if any of that is true, right? All plumb bobs go down. They go 
straight down. Now, a globe will tell you they all point towards the center point of the Earth, so they're all pointing in different directions, which is down for all of them, and none of them are ever parallel, right? Start getting into that. It gets, it just, your brain melts and people just give up and they're like, I'm just going to stick with my ball because mm -hmm. that's what I've been taught and that's what the majority does. So back to gravity. Everything in this world, from the air around us to our bodies, to the food we eat, to your cameras, to the lights, everything is electrostatic. Everything has an electrostatic charge. So the ground has a neutral charge. Some people say it's a negative charge. We'll just call it neutral. And the sky has a positive charge. Right. It's measurable because as you go up every meter, there's another thousand volts of wattage volts is a volt or amps or whatever it is. OK. And as you go up, there's more and more. And that gets into the whole harnessing electricity out of the air. But first, first thing is to have that that electric charge um, gradation. You have to have two Gaussian surfaces, two flat surfaces. So we got the flat ground. There must be a flat sky up there, right? That's a problem for the globe. But electrostatics, we can test electrostatics. Mm -hmm. So a little test that we did is um, we had uh, helium balloons and we tied them to uh, just a little pin. We just something and they were neutrally buoyant, like two inches off the floor. And we had a wire connected that to a Van der Graaff generator. And that Van der Graaff generator can in introduce a, a positive charge to it. So it's floating, neutrally buoyant, and we cranked up the Van der Graaff generator. So we're changing the charge of that neutrally buoyant pin, and it went down. Mm. So did we change gravity, or do we change the electrostatic charge? We change the electrostatic charge. We discharge it, and it rises back up. So we just manipulated the variable, which is the electrostatic charge, and we had a, we had a result. So we can say... We've just proved that electrostatics are responsible for up and down. The, so there's a flow of energy from the sky into the ground, measurable. That establishes the down. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the interesting part. This is where numbers, we're going to get into some numbers. Don't worry. This is really easy. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Um, mainstream science, the heliocentrists, say that the electrostatic charge, the electrostatic force is 10 to the 36 power stronger than gravity. That's a massive, massive number. Massive is not the right word. Right. Like you can't <laughs> there even is conceive no of that number. There, yeah, you right. can't even conceive <laughs> right, of that right. number. So 10 to the 36 power. That's their own claims, right? That's like their 10 own claim. to the 36 right. times stronger than gravity. MIT has a drone. They call it the silent drone. It looks like a skid, like a skid, you know, a box yeah. skid. And it flies with electrostatics, no moving parts, right? Um, and it flies because they, they can maintain a negative charge in it. It separates from the earth and it flies and they can control it, mm. right? The XRT3B or whatever that secret triangle aircraft is yeah. flies on electrostatics. It you think lifts. this is how like, quote, UFO technology works, like the disks that we see? If, Possibly. If, if I threw a rock over your house while you were in the backyard and you didn't know it was a rock, it's a UFO because right. you don't know what it is. So Okay, I'm saying like <laughs> the specific claims surrounding disks that are flying that I are silent. I think that they're using electrostatics. Yeah, Absolutely. that's what I thought too. That's exactly and I think that uh, the electrostatics are used in a lot of things that we're just unaware of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that gets into the whole how do big airplanes fly and that's a whole nother rabbit hole. So we can prove that things go up and down due to electrostatics. The science says electrostatics are 10 to the 36 power stronger than gravity, right? So do you know how long a trillion seconds is? I mean, how long? Gotta, Take I, a guess. I, if I you guess it within a week, you dumb. get one of the six Bitcoins. It's probably like over 100 years or something like over that. Over 100? You yeah. want to round it down a little bit? Around, okay, 80 years. Very, very close. Okay. 31,000 years. Okay. <laughs> You had me run it down, you <laughs> asshole. <laughs> All right. 31,000 years. Now, why am I telling you that? Just, I, you need to understand right. what science does. They've diluted your mind, right? 31,000 years is one trillion seconds. Yeah, that's a lot. You, you, your point is that you can't conceive of how big the number so, a trillion so, is. So 31,000 years. So if I came over there and gave you a, a solid punch in the shoulder, right? Like, cause you pulled some stupid hay bale trick on me or something. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I punch you and uh, it would, you'd be like, Hey, cut it out. Right. And if I punch you 10 times harder, you'd probably punch me back. Mm -hmm. If I punch you a hundred times farther, you'd probably hit the floor. I think I could knock you on a floor easy. Right. I might even break your shoulder a thousand times might break your back. 
a million times harder, you're dead, right? You probably went through the wall and, you know, into the ground a billion times harder, unfathomable, a trillion times harder. That's 12 zeros. We still have to go up to 36 zeros. Right. Okay. So what is science telling us? That gravity is nothing. Mm -hmm. The electrostatic force is weak, but it's 10 to the 36 power stronger than gravity. That tells me that gravity is, well, 0.0, 36 zeros, and maybe a one if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay. So gravity is nothing. Yeah. Where's the argument? So really, it's negligible. Is what it, they're negligible using. is the wrong word. Right. It's yeah. it's infinitesimally, impossibly small. Right. It's unmeasurable. Yeah. All right. So that's what they're telling us in their double speak. Mm-hmm. So anyone that's claiming gravity is doesn't know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. You can't manipulate gravity. Right. You know, and magnetism and electrostatics go together. We have maglev trains. We have electrostatic flight. Right. We have the the triangle aircraft. The, I, I should learn the name of it. Um, and we can manipulate things on a small scale ourselves. And then during lightning storms, things fall at a different rate. You know, everything falls at 9.8 meters per second. That proves gravity. No, 9.8 meters per second is an average. And during electrical storms, it's been measured that things fall at different speeds because the air is charged Wouldn't they just claim that that's the ma- like based on the mass, though, of the object? That's what they claim. Right. The, 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 manipulate it. Show me. We manipulated it with mm-hmm. electrostatics. We made things lighter, yeah, made things point. heavier. And people say, well, why don't you just do it yourself and float? Because that much would kill you. Mm-hmm. That much uh, That mm-hmm. much would kill you. Won't they claim, though, that, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, likening this to my time in physics class at West Point that it's repeatable that using the negative 9.8 meters per second squared equation with gravity based on the mass of objects, you can get a consistent output and actually measure it. Like you can take it out. Huh? You can't. You can't? No, you can't. And no one, no one's measuring it. And the, and the one experiment that everybody points to is in a vacuum chamber, which wasn't even a full vacuum chamber. They dropped a bowling ball and a feather at the same time. I think it was um, Mythbusters or, or um, um, Brian Cox, but lying box, I call him. Um, they, they showed it. Go back and watch that, right, where the, they fall at the same rate. Um, I think that works in an electrostatic world. You okay. know, I don't think that there's any resistance and maybe they would fall. But the thing is, if you watch it, edit, edit, edit. it's like a NASA launch. Edit, mm. edit. And just before it hit, there's like seven edits. Just show us the whole thing. Right. Okay. When you have seven edits before a, a rocket clears the launch pad, you got a problem. So for the vacuum, they were trying to control for any atmospheric interference yeah. or any wind or anything like this. Yeah. Like to- a drop of feather, it's floating in the air. If there's no air, it probably will fall as fast as a brick. Yeah. Wow. Okay. The other physics related thing that I want to get into, and we'll probably get into some other ones, is gas pressure next to a vacuum. Now, I've watched countless uh, flat earth debunking videos, especially from the likes of, and I cannot, I, this guy, even if, even if I did agree with him and I don't, but even if I did, I would refuse to watch him because he is such a prick in the way that he comes across. And it's Professor Dave. I like, the old musician Dave, who's not a professor, who just calls himself I Professor Dave. Wrote, like, even watching your discussion with him, yeah. th- I think in the first 20 minutes, I pointed out like 27 logical fallacies, and then I just turned it off. I'm like, this dude is not actually interested in an academic discussion. He was just being a dick. And for those people who aren't attuned to logical fallacies, they'll be like, oh, Professor Dave killed uh, yeah. Flat Earth Dave. I'm like, no chance he didn't kill Flat Earth Dave. There's like 27 logical fallacies at the very beginning, and he was just being a prick and being overbearing and that's why it seemed like to those who aren't trained in logical fallacies that he quote won so there's a channel um on youtube called mind shock and it's a professor um who hides his identity hides his voice but he's uh an he analyzes logical fallacies and ad homs in debates and he doesn't pick flat earth or globe but Secretly, he's a flat earther. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, probably. I yeah. mean, I don't even know. But he just analyzes them logically. Right. And uh, Professor Dave broke all records. I bet. I mean, he, he did yeah. the whole thing. It's like a three-hour video. And uh, I think Professor Dave almost hit 400. And, and those I, hosts, I, I don't even, yeah. I don't want to get off on a tangent. Those yeah. hosts did a horror. Like, they, horrible, obviously, horrible. They, they were so I, I stupidly went into that debate thinking that the guy wanted to learn. And I was actually going to tell him something. And it was just, 
um, you know, he is one of the very few that are probably, well, are definitely paid because he's getting millions of views and he's getting, you know, right. his algorithm uh, shoots yeah. him to the top. Yeah, absolutely. So again, you know, he's for weak minded people, mm -hmm. you know, um, but if you take the time and look and think, um, you'll see that, uh, that none of that is true. Right. And the fact that Google feeds you him when you search something that has no relation to me right. and that debate and they feed you it. But um, that debate has woken up a lot of people that would have never have looked because a lot of people like, you know, I'm not a flat earther. Flat earth is stupid. But why did he act like that? Right. And I was like, here, watch these videos. Watch right. the the um, the the my crash course videos from my app. And uh, and then they'll they'll never have found those videos unless they emailed me. Right. And then a couple of days later, I get an email back. They go, oh, my God, this this is real. I had no idea. Right. And I was like, welcome. Welcome to the you, globe line. You know, you know what I think it is? It's because. Like I bet, let me say this first off, it is very clear that if you just believe in flat earth, you're not causing harm to anyone else by just believing in flat earth. So you have to ask, why do they algorithmically push it to the bottom and not let people see flat earth videos? Let me, let me continue real quick. And I think that it would be interesting if you took a thousand people who are self-proclaimed flat earthers. And a thousand people who were, you know, heliocentrists and uh, gave them a survey on whether they fell for COVID, whether they fell for 9 11, whether they fell for all these other things. It would be overwhelmingly that flat earthers did not fall for a lot of other stuff, which doesn't necessarily mean that flat earth is true, but it's like, I think that not only do they demonetize flat earth because there's a lot of inconsistencies surrounding heliocentrism that flat earthers point out, but it's also because the likelihood of flat earthers yeah. to also not buy other stuff is very high. So I, you know, I made an app, it's called the flat earth sun, moon and Zodiac clock app. And on it, we have the friend finder and it shows you a heat map of the world of all the flat earthers. Um, 99 point whatever percent of them are unvaxxed. Yeah. So it's kind of like, Hey, something's going on there. Right. You know, the Glober is like, Oh, you're a flat earther. You're probably an anti-vaxxer. Yeah. You're that's one thing you got, right. You got that one, right. How come exactly. you can't get anything else? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they try to pin it together as a bad thing, yeah. but, um, it, it, the evidence again is, is undeniable, but again, believing is easy you say yeah. we i don't believe the earth is flat i know it's not a globe and i know it's level and horizontal i know it doesn't rotate and i know it doesn't curve i'm a flat earther mm -hmm. yeah like what what can you go with at, at that point when you falsify all those right. other things yep. okay so i, I want to go back to where we were with that with the gas pressure next to a vacuum so what the likes of professor quote professor dave would say is that Oh, you think that gas pressure can't exist next to a vacuum because you're thinking of vacuum in the context of sucking. What we're talking about with the vacuum here is just void of other materials, other objects, sure. other substances, right? Um, but so I took thermodynamics at West Point and that was an like related to entropy. There were some established things that I learned and the accepted globe model is the only thing that I can think of that violates what they claim is laws of thermodynamics. Everything. Right. So let, let's, let's touch on that gas pressure next to a vacuum. So gas violently fills the available space. Right. Violently. Right. It does. Right. Absolutely. Um, and they, the heliocentrists say that gravity is strongest closer to earth and it gets a little less as you get up higher, but it's still gravity. There's gravity in space. There's gravity where the space station is the International Fake Station. Just remember, gravity's strongest next to Earth. They say that gravity's holding onto the air. As you go up top of Mount Everest, it's really hard to breathe because the air is thinner. So it's get, they say it just gets thinner, 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 thinner until there's no air. Cool story, bro, right? But that means I could have a shoebox filled with air here, down on the ground. No, I, I'm sorry, a shoebox filled with air, right? suck all the air out of this room and open up the top of the shoe box and the air will stay in the box because gravity is holding it down. It's stronger down here. Remember that. Mm -hmm. Right. And we all know that's not true. That's not right. going to happen. You can take a container without any air in it and at any altitude, open up a, a valve on the side, top, bottom, doesn't matter. And it is violently going to equalize that pressure. Right. 
no matter where you are. And this is repeatable and observable. And no matter how many like experiments you do, no you what cannot size. show anywhere in nature or in a lab, high pressure next to low pressure without a vacuum. Now, yeah. is there a pressure gradient? Yes. In your tank of propane, it's half empty. You got propane on the bottom, liquid, then it's a thicker gas and it gets thinner all the way up. And if you measure the, the, it's all under pressure. You put a hole anywhere in that tank, all of the gas is gone mm. at any altitude, a anywhere. To have pressure, a pressure gradient, you need a container. Mm. It's as simple as it is. Yeah. But because you pre-assume a globe without a container, therefore gravity doesn't have to obey that law. It's just like dark matter and dark energy. Which is so interesting because, again, just as you said, they... According to their own claims, gravity is less than negligible when it comes to that versus electricity. Understatement of the year, less right. than negligible. We <laughs> right. have to come up with a new a new term. I right. can't figure it out. Right. And so there's yeah. there's two inconsistencies right there. Like, yeah. oh, gravity is what's keeping this gas pressure without a closed container next to a vacuum, even though in countless, literally every single example, when it comes to thermodynamics, you cannot demonstrate right. that that's the case. And so, then electrostatics are much more like infinitely more important than so let's let's, gravity. let's stick on the gas a little bit we're going to go into outer space though okay. for a moment all right so helium and hydrogen defy gravity they go up right mm -hmm. in a balloon goes up helium and hydrogen stars are made from 99 percent helium and hydrogen and they come from our nebulas the giant crab nebula that we were shown a nebula is so big you can't fathom right and it's made of dust and gas in space <laughs> so you have dust and gas floating in a vacuum without a container and now that dust and gas decides to collapse upon itself how much helium and hydrogen do you need before it starts collapsing instead of expanding All right this right. is this is where brains just turn off All right and so in these nebulas they say that they're popping out stars left and right what is it doing it uh, a whole bunch of gas collapses. It goes, okay, that's big enough, Charlie. That that one's, you know, big, right? And then, was it pop it out like a ping pong ball machine? And then it goes, parks itself over in the galaxy arm somewhere? How come the whole thing just doesn't collapse upon itself? If it's collapsing, it's collapsing. They say our sun is one of the smallest stars in our galaxy. Right? The other ones are so big. You've seen, the, everyone's seen the model like Betelgeuse. It would be like a yoga ball and our sun is like a grain of sand and the earth is invisible. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Betelgeuse isn't even one of the bigger ones, right? There's even bigger ones. This is ridiculous. This right. is nonsense. Well, then, then, then as it relates to that, one thing that always gets me, and I had this down in my list of questions, but how I, this has never stuck with me even when I was a heliocentricist. How is it that the sun's, gra quote, gravitational pull is so strong that it keeps the Earth and the other planets locked where they are, Yeah. right? But then- the Earth is outweighing the 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 suns in order to keep the moon locked to the yeah. Earth. Yeah. When it's a smaller object with a smaller mass, right? And it's all about mass when it comes to gravity, supposedly. And then, how is it that relative to the moon, these other quote planets that are beyond the the Earth are staying where they are? Right. Like it does it does not make sense, especially so, if it's like gravitational pull. Wouldn't it then all collapse in on itself? Uh, Baller, Baller, Baller Dave will answer that question for you from the Baller point of view. Okay. Right, right. Okay. What well, would he say to that? Well, the, well I, I, I'm Baller Dave, by the oh, way. Oh, I thought you said Ball Earth Dave. <laughs> no, like, Baller, oh. Dave, Baller Dave. I go, sometimes <laughs> I go on a show as Baller Dave where I just argue against flat earthers and I just say yeah, the yeah. dumbest crap ever. Yeah. And that's actually what Globers actually say. Literally what they say. Yeah. Yeah, okay. They say that the moon, the Earth's gravity is way closer to the sun. It's only a quarter of a million miles right. away. The sun's 93 million miles away. They're Therefore, the Earth's gravity supersedes the sun's right. gravity. But somehow the sun, the gas ball of helium and hydrogen, can hold on to Pluto and Uranus, right. okay? Which are infant so much farther, right. right? So there's a thing called the three-body problem. You're, you're aware of it? Mm -hmm. Three body, I'll explain it for, for anyone that's not. We can take a world supercomputer and we can say, okay, we got a ball, we'll call it a star. It's got this much gravity. We got a planet and we'll put it in orbit. And that computer will tell you exactly where it's going to be for the next million years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Add one more body in that something orbiting the sun or something orbiting the earth, you know, moon or another planet. And the thing goes haywire. No computer can figure out what it's going to do next. Three bodies. Okay. How many bodies are in our 
galaxy. Guess it within two, and I'll give you a Bitcoin. Oh my goodness. <laughs> There's a hundred billion stars, they say, and right. each one of them has planets, and each one of those planets has multiple moons. It's just, that's a stupid question. Right. I was just being silly. Right. Um, but in our solar system alone, we have eight or nine planets, and they have multiple moons, and right. And somehow they keep time better than the finest Swiss watch. And I can say that confidently because all time is kept by the sky clock, mm-hmm. right? The sky clock is what keeps time, is what time is. And we have these planetary alignments where nothing gets yanked out of place. Google, go on YouTube and look up the three body problem. And they'll show you animations of what happens when three bodies try to interact. They, they, it just turns into spaghetti. Right. And, uh, so how can we predict where all of these things are going to be unless it's built like a clock? Mm -hmm. And we still have throughout, again, if, if we're appealing to, uh, history being somewhat correct and even what most in our community believe about ancient civilizations, assuming that that's all correct and there's not some type of reset. Let's just play with that for a second. Countless civilizations throughout history have seen the exact same stars in the sky or lights in the sky forever. And it's like, if we're on a ball that's world spinning, that's uh, revolving around a sun and all these other planets are too, and then all the stars and we're just whirling throughout the galaxy, how is it that we see the exact same lights in the sky throughout history forever? It's, it, it's worse than that. Um, so most people are taught the flat solar system where the sun and everything that's going around like a record, mm-hmm. right? A perfect disc. But in reality, the sun's moving at a half a million miles per hour and they're all chasing it. So it's making a corkscrew, right. a crazy corkscrew. The earth is going... And all the other planets are staying on the same plane, chasing the sun. And then our, our moon is doing little loops around us at the same time. Crazy corkscrew going four and a half billion miles a year, never to return to where it was before. All of the other stars are doing their own directions. Right. The entire galaxy is spinning. Right. They tell us 80 percent, 85 percent of the stars are probably binary or trinary, which means that they're going around each other right. at the same time. And never once in history. Have two stars changed position due to parallax? Right. right? Never once in history has that happened. Never right. once. So the Great Pyramid of Giza, by the way, which is one of those. Uh, there's so many pyramids on Earth now. Have you seen all the pyramids they're finding in China? It's yeah. crazy. Right. But the Pyramid of Giza has a shaft that points right at Polaris. And the historians will go, well, 2000 years ago, it pointed towards Thuban because the earth is wobbling. And, uh, you know, that used to be the North Star. But now, you know, like prove it. Well, you got to wait 2000 years. So you're never going to prove it. Right. And it just happens to be pointing towards Polaris now, which is our center point of rotation. That what they tell yeah, us. It happens to be perfectly aligned with another star. So you're familiar yeah. with the Georgia Guidestones, right? Yeah, absolutely. And they so Georgia, those. Yeah, Georgia Guidestones, besides the Ten Commandments on there, and that's a whole other yeah. another podcast. The population thing. Um, there, it was a clock, and it has a little hole through the center one that points right at Polaris. Now, mm-hmm. they say that all of the movement, the 4.4 billion miles a year, over thousands of years doesn't matter because the stars are so far away there's no parallax you know, about that mountain in the distance as you're driving down the road that mountain that's you know 50 miles away which you shouldn't be able to see um it doesn't look like it's really moving all right well these are so much farther that there's no parallax cool story bro Remember, we got to get back to actually seeing stars um but the wobble that's different so every Possession of the equinox, that's that's what they say. So every 76 years, the polar axis wobbles one degree. One degree is equivalent to three full moons side by side. Well, the Georgia Guidestones were up for 40 plus years. So it's over a half a degree, which is a moon and a half, if not more, which would have put Polaris way out of that tiny little hole. But it was still there. So we started making videos about it. Started going viral on TikTok all over the place. Boom. Terrorists blew up the Georgia Guidestones. Three hours later, the bulldozers were there. Took the entire thing down. No investigation. Interesting. Yeah. Undeniable proof that the earth isn't wobbling. And they blew it up. And they blamed it on a terrorist. And there was no investigation. It's crazy. It's yeah. Crazy. 
for those of you that are short circuiting, want more information, do not Google my name. Oh, everyone's Googling my name right now. Yeah. <laughs> do not search flat earth. You're just going to get fed propaganda. It's like searching uh, your main topic, which is health right. freedom, yeah, searching yeah, for, no you know, our virus is real, right? Um, you're not going to get any real information. You have to come here for that real information. 100%. You have to, you have to do that on my website, flatearthdave.com. I have the crash course. It's free right there. I created an app that bypasses the algorithm. It gives you access to all of the stuff. It's a $3 app, one-time charge. Um, it does all of these other things. Feel free to get it or just watch the, the crash course. It's incredible too, because you have a whole content library. If you, you know, keyword search, if you're thinking of a certain topic, we're like, well, I haven't figured out how this makes sense according to uh you know flat earth perspective you can type in any of those topics right. if somebody it. goes what about this picture of uh of the sun underneath the clouds that only can happen on a globe just go to the image search and search sun under clouds and i'll show you a whole bunch of pictures of the sun below the clouds but the tops of the clouds are lit and the bottoms are dark mm -hmm. right and i explained to you how it's done why do you see that illusion looking up at the lights in the sky is no way to prove the shape of the floor mm -hmm. right the lights on your ceiling have no relation to your floor so check out the crash course on flatearthdave.com i challenge anybody watch the first three videos and you too will um be exiled from your globey family and friends <laughs> but they'll come around eventually because right. the world is waking up this is this is big there's a lot of big people waking up you know people in the health i don't want to out anyone in the health freedom uh movement let's just say all of them except one are flat earther therefore <laughs> one one person doesn't have that bullet in their rifle okay <laughs> all but one are flat earthers. Yeah. We, Dave, right? Dave knows a lot of my friends who have not outed themselves as, uh, yeah. let's say, not believing in the heliocentric model. So that was actually a perfect segue what you said a minute ago. You can't figure out the shape of the ground by looking at the lights in the sky because that was one of my next questions. This is what you hear from a lot of people who believe in the heliocentric model is why would ours be flat if the other ones aren't flat? Yeah. <laughs> Which, again... For those who aren't familiar with logical fallacies, that's begging the question because you're already begging the question that those things, those lights in the sky, those objects in the sky are other planets. And then you're assuming that we must also then be on the planet. So you're already begging the question of the heliocentric model, Very good. looking at lights in the sky in order to uh, determine the shape of the ground. But I I'd love for you to expand upon that. Yeah. Why would ours be flat if yeah. the uh, other ones are not? So- the only pictures of other planets you've ever seen are from Disney and NASA, and Disney's more credible than NASA at this point. That's right? scary. All right. Um, well, I'm an amateur astronomer, and I've got a big telescope. Yep, you're seeing a light in the sky. It used to be called a wandering star until NASA came around. Mm. And uh, they're, you know, in my opinion, this is my opinion, I have no proof, they're sentient. They're angelic, if you ask me. Right, they're all named after gods too, which is very interesting. But you know, that's just a naming uh, a naming thing. Mm. So <clears throat> let's let's look at Jupiter. Jupiter is the best because Jupiter um, has been in the sky a lot recently, and it's it looks like a star. It's as bright as the sun. It's just very small. It's like three times bigger than the brightest star that you'll see. You know, you'll look up and like, wow, that's really bright, right? So Jupiter, what's Jupiter? It's made up of 98% helium and hydrogen. It's a dusty, gassy planet. According to them. According to them. It's 400, I think it's 400 million miles away from the sun. We're 92. So it's four times farther away <clears throat> from the sun as us. So the inverse square law works on brightness and size. Every time you double the distance to something, it's a quarter of the size. OK, so if we went from let's round up we're 100 million miles, we go to 200 million miles, the sun would be a quarter of the size. Mm. Then we go to as far as Jupiter, the sun would be a 16th of this size. A quarter of a quarter is a 16th. So if you were on Jupiter. And you're looking at the sun. It's tiny. Mm. It's tiny. It's very tiny. This is not a theory. This is actual math, actual science. Not not pseudoscience. So you got that little sun. It's going to produce less light, too. It's bouncing off of your gassy, non-reflective surface. 
and it's traveling all the way back to your eye here on Earth, 400 million miles. As it travels, every time it doubles its distance, it gets half its brightness. Okay. What are we seeing? Okay. Just don't let your mind melt. Think that through. How could it be so bright? Go outside and look at a cement ball, like out in front of Target or whatever, you know, wherever that's one of those cement balls at noon on a sunny day. Is that light that's bouncing off of that blinding you? Should because it should. You're standing right next to it mm-hmm. and you're uh, four times closer to the sun than, than, than Jupiter is. Is it casting shadow, your shadow behind you, that, that ball, that, that rock? No. And that smooth cement rock is more reflective than a gassy, dirty planet, a dusty, dirty moon. Mm-hmm. Look at the moon in the sky. Think that you don't know anything. Pretend you were never taught anything. Is that a light or is that a dusty, dirty ball? Look at the moon, a full moon or near full moon, when there's some spotty clouds in the sky, when you have like sky, scattered all over. It's only lighting up the clouds that are right next to it. What are you saying, Dave, that the moon is right next to the sun? I don't know what I'm saying because we don't know where the sun is or the moon is. It's in an apparent position. One of the experiments. Have you thought about it being a projection of something elsewhere, even outside, you know, according to most flat the firmament? You know, I think it's above our side of the firmament. Mm-hmm. It could be within the firmament. Is the firmament thin? Is the firmament a million miles th- firmament, a million miles thick, and the sun is in it? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I appreciate this too, and that's yeah. what I love about you. Is you're like, I have no idea what it right. is, but I just know that it, whatever they're claiming right. is, it's demonstrably. People false. Are like, what do you mean, the parent size? I did an experiment, and I took a, uh, I had a blue sheet, and I divided my room in half with the blue sheet. I hung the sheet from the ceiling. And uh, ten feet on the other side of the sheet, I had a flashlight that actually had a square lens on it. Mm-hmm. And Paige and I are standing on the other side of the sheet and there's a bright spot on the sheet and it looked just like a sun. Mm -hmm. It really looked like a sun. And I'm standing five feet to her right. And I said, where do you see the sun on that sheet? And she was pointing to a completely different spot than I was pointing to. We both saw it at the same time in two different positions. Yeah. That's why, what I mean by an apparent position. Yeah. And and that's where I've seen some videos where, I think that I've even seen some videos where um, some heliocentrists will say that it's hard to triangulate the sun. It's impossible to triangulate the sun. Yeah. Because if I'm talking be- about using trigonometry specifically yeah, in yeah, order to figure you out can't, the You can't do it if you're seeing it in a different position. Yeah. And uh, there's a great video on my app on um, where does the sun go section on the frequently asked questions page. There's a video done by a very scientific where they... They showed the shadows and stuff. Maybe we should get into your uh, Greek uh, Aristosthenes yeah, at this yeah. point. Well, that's what I had yeah. a whole section on curvature. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. To next. Um, and because that's a that's one you know I threw that up. Well, Aristosthenes proved it two thousand years ago. What do you what do you if they're throwing out science, right? So when you start understanding what that experiment was and the fact that there's no written story about Aristosthenes' experiment before the nineteen hundreds. Right? Would they forget about them for 2,000 years? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Where did it pop up? It came, I think it was in the 1950s. It popped up in the Rockefeller funded textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay. Of course. So we might, as well, we might as well just jump into that. You want to yeah, go there? Yeah, let's jump into that. So the Eratosthenes, the story changed too. Eratosthenes looked down a well in uh, Greece on a certain day of the year. He could see the sun reflection on the bottom, which means the sun is directly over him. Good observation. Good science fact. Okay. And then he theorized, hey, if the earth is a globe and he sends his buddy 5,000 5, miles, what, 5,000 or 500? 5,000, I think. Okay. 5,000, it's 5,000. 5,000 miles away, he can do this, a measurement at the same time and we can see. And Zarasasi said, hey, I can put a stick vertical on the ground. There'll be no shadow. And then if my buddy at the same time sees a shadow, he can do some perfectly good math assuming the earth is a globe and figure out the diameter of the earth. And this is, this is them determining the radius, the radius of the earth and and the the circumference of the earth. And, um, according to Carl Sagan in the series cosmos, they drilled it into everyone's mind that 
that it could only be done on a flat earth. Okay. First thing I have Carl to Carl Sagan said that? that oh, yeah. In the, in the show earth? Cosmos. Oh, yeah. There was a big Carl sex. Sagan actually said that? Uh, Carl Sagan was a bamboozler. He said you have to, you, you can't convince somebody that they've been bam- bamboozled. That was the word he used. Um, but he's the one bamboozling. It's so crazy. What? Everything is backwards. Um, yeah, he was in the club. What he's the one, heck, he's one of them. And I loved it. So wait, but here's a question I asked for you. So that's back, according to history, horse and buggies. We don't have any right, Teslas right. or anything, mm-hmm. no airplanes, right? So the guy, what, he- How many miles away? 5,000. 5,000. Was it 5,000 or 500? Let's just say it's 500. Okay, let's say 500. Let's, yeah, I think yeah, it's, yeah, maybe okay. it's 500. 5,000 is a lot. No, no, that's, it's that's 500. Part. I'm sorry, okay, 5,000 is too much. So it was yeah, 500. 500. Sorry, correct me, 500. And you know how he measured it? Oh. He counted his steps. No. <laughs> so zero 157,900 what wait wait what number was i on <laughs> no oh crap i gotta go back he walked 500 miles and counted his no steps way. no way okay no way so that's problem number one problem number two he gets there i don't even know what time it is all right let's right. say they figure that they're really good at th- how is he gonna know to do the experiment at the exact same time Eratosthenes does. How does he know the exact same time? Do they have a long string and a cup? Or, hello, hello. <laughs> I mean, how are they communicating? Right. How is this experiment even done? And let's say aliens gave them cell phones. Or, and, may, or maybe they had advanced technology maybe back they then did. that has been destroyed. And he, they both had their sticks and because one stick was straight up and one stick was this and sun rays. Oh, Eratosthenes also believed that sun rays come in parallel because when the sun's so far away that they come in parallel that, on, on that point yeah. today. Yeah. There, it was a, it was a set like partly cloudy morning this morning. Yeah. You see those parallel rays? No parallel rays ever. Ever. Like, again, that was another thing that nobody I has was a ever seen no. parallel rays. They You've come seen in like rays. crepuscular rays. They yeah. come in like this. Yeah, exactly. So no one's ever seen crepuscular rays. And back I mean, then, no one's ever seen parallel, no rays. parallel rays. Right. right. No yeah. one's ever seen parallel rays. Thank you. I have listexia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, I think they were geocentric back then, which means to have parallel rays, that means you have an infinitely far sun, 93 right. million miles or whatever, that's infinitely right. far. Right. And it's orbiting the earth. Mm-hmm. That's geocentric. How do you have a geocentric world with an infinitely far sun orbiting the earth? Right? Again, nobody asked these questions. Mm-hmm. But let's say he did the measurements. The sun was infinitely far. One stick had no shadow. The other stick had a shadow length. They can do the math and figure out the sphericity of the world. And it was pretty accurate. On a flat earth with a small local sun, the experiment works the same. Here's the, everyone can do this right now. Get two beer bottles, two candles, two you know lighters, whatever you got. Two posts. Put them on your table and hold a light over one of them. It has no shadow. And the one a foot away has a shadow. You can use the same math and figure out the sphericity of your table. And you'll be accurate within 2%, according to Carl Sagan. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how they came up with the radius and the circumference. Of and the all Earth. of the math. He's the Michael Jordan of mathematicians. He figured yeah. this out. And all of the mathematicians through the next couple centuries that came from that area that wrote books Never mentioned him. Mm. That would be like writing a, a book about the Chicago Bulls and never mentioning Michael Jordan. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. The The thing that I want to bring up next related to curvature, we've already talked the the radius and that experiment by, what's his name again? The Greek name? Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes. Yeah. Eratosthenes. Okay. Is the distance between cities on a non-globe? Because- the videos that I've watched of people claiming to debunk or claiming to prove the globe and claiming to debunk the, uh, the, uh, geocentric claims is that, um, the, on a flat stationary map of the earth, which I know you don't buy the, uh, the Gleason map necessarily, right? It's the closest map that we have right now. Okay. Closest that we have, but it's in, you know, you haven't been everywhere, so you I haven't. Can, no, right, exactly. But I have climb. tested. I I have tested my my flat Earth clock app. The sun goes around wherever the sun is. It's noon, and I've called people. I'm like, hey, the sun's right over Sydney. Let me call my friend, and uh, that's in Sydney. I'm like, where's the sun, and what time is it? And he's like, it's right above me, and it's noon. So it works on on your flat. It works on my. On it, it's close. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But even like. 
from my understanding, even when it came to this last eclipse that we just had, and I want to talk eclipses in a minute, they were adjusting the precise location up until the time of the eclipse, like yep. the precise location and yep. time of totality. So even the accepted quote scientific community is still adjusting on the fly when it comes to some of these phenomena. We talk about so, eclipses for a second right real, now. Okay, real quick, let's <laughs> talk about eclipses. So, so they, they tell us that the sun is four hundred times bigger than the moon, and the and the sun is four hundred times farther than the moon. Therefore, they look like they're the same size. Right. Okay. Cool story, bro. Right. And somehow they line up like precision coins. With each other. The chances of that happening are one, to 10 to the 36, we'll just say. What, what about the people, though, that like will take a filter and put it in front of the sun and the sun looks way smaller than it appears to our naked eye? Right. Well, the, a lot of, there's a lot of glare on the sun. Right. A lot of glare. Right. A lot of glare on the sun. Um, and and that, that'll that take out the glare. But the fact is, they say that they appear to be the same size because it's 400 times farther mm -hmm. and it's 400 times, you know, bigger. Right. And so sizing and scaling work all right that that that's the thing you know you can take um you know a, a disc that's four times bigger than another disc bring it four times farther and it'll look like it's the same size right that's called scaling so the chances of it happening once are so infinitesimally small that it's incalculable but it happens again and again and again and then the cycle repeats every 18 years and two months or whatever um it repeats the same eclipses happen again and again and again and again like a perfect precision clock right how's and that and that's based on the saros cycle the right? Sor saros cycle there's saros two cycle. there's two not cycles. george soros cycle yeah not the george soros maybe, <laughs> maybe it is who knows saros. <laughs> yeah um which the Saros cycle, from my understanding, works on either. So this is the one that falls into both camps where it works on both the globe model and the flat stationary the model. The problem with the globe model is it nothing works on the globe model. Okay. I mean, but you can claim it. But you working. said you said there's three bulls. There's one like that it works on uh, yeah. just the flat stationary, one that works on how both. Does that, that, explain the three-body problem. How, how would that work on yeah, the that's globe? That's a good point. All right? how, how, how do all of these things happen on a, such a precision, exact basis um, all of the time, right. right? When when you start looking at it, you know they use astrolades. Um, you know about the antikythera mechanism that was discovered off of Greece two thousand years. Was it two thousand years ago? It's a calculator. It's a computer um, that shows you the, all the eclipses and the and the position of some of the planets and the phases of the moon. And it's more accurate than our clocks are today. And is it based on a flat stationary flat stationary Earth? Oh. All of this stuff is based on a flat stationary Earth. I mean, to fly an airplane, you have to treat the Earth as flat and stationary or you will die. This is an important point. We're going to go off on 100 tangents. That's just what I do on the show. So um, I will say this. Someone that I talk to every day, let's say I'm not going to out who they are, but someone that I talk to every day uh, had a jet, no longer has a jet, and has two pilots of that jet. And I've met those pilots because I've been on said jet. And those two pilots, he didn't specifically choose them to be flat earthers, but they just happened to be both of them mm. flat earthers as pilots. And, um, you were mentioning yesterday that you have pilots in your pocket that you could call right now, countless pilots that are also flat earthers. They're too, also right? flat earthers and they, they complain about their other, you know, co-pilots. Some of these guys are just bus drivers that don't think well, well I'll give we were actually with one of the guys that was at your gathering last night. That's a good friend of mine. He is also a pilot and he is also a flat earther. So, too. um, an American airlines pilot, friend of mine he uh he said that when he fir first when he first was in flight school you know he's a he's an old timer um that you had the if you couldn't rebuild that airplane you weren't allowed to fly it you mm -hmm. had to know everything about it now commercial airline pilots when they say in flight school uh, how does that work the answer they get is you don't need to know that just look at the numbers just do this. They're just literally computer operators. Right. And uh, they take off and land. Very good at that. And then they're just turning dials and letting the plane fly itself. And, you know, AI is picking flight routes and heights and everything. And they use all of these jet streams. There's all different jet streams up there. We found a, um, an a FAA document saying that at a, like 45,000 feet, there's 350 mile an hour winds. Mm. 350. So imagine you get into that jet stream with a 350 mile an hour tailwind. That might explain some of these trips that are kind of long on a flat earth that'll get you there in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're on an airplane, um, you're flying somewhere and you leave the gate 40 minutes late or whatever. You somehow make up the time. You, you get there on time because if you didn't, the entire air system falls apart. So AI says, all right, we need to get you there. Then we're going to put you into this jet stream. We're going to fly you on this route. We're going to go at this speed. And um, 
and it gets you there on time. Now, how do they know where all of those jet streams are? Hmm. Do you know that every single day worldwide, there's a thousand helium weather balloons released twice a day? That's 2,000 a day. I think it's 900 and something. We'll just round off. 2,000 a day that are reporting back the weather, the wind, the atmospheric pressure. It all goes back to a supercomputer that models out the whole thing so they know exactly what the winds are doing everywhere. Whoa. So they can plan everything. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 2,000 every single day. Who's the, who's the largest consumer? What industry, or I guess what organization? Who is the owns largest? all the helium yeah. in the world? That would be NASA. <laughs> on my That's app, easy. You can find that yeah. one on Google. Listen, you can on, find that one on Google. On my on my app, um, the Flat Earth Sun, Moon, and Zodiac Clock app. Yeah. You can find it at flatearthdave.com. There's a section called Rockets Are Balloons. Uh -huh. Okay. First, bring a box of tissues if you love space. <laughs> bring, you know, if you love Elon. If you I was love just thinking of my kid self, yeah. man. I'm like, damn, and, that really and, sucks. And when you see this, you're going to be like, oh my God, how did I miss that? I want to say that at the beginning. Um, flat earthers know more about the heliocentric model than Globers do, mm -hmm. than the people that believe the globe. They know, if you knew a, if they knew a tenth of what we knew, you would reject the globe. You're like, something's wrong here. Right. But we know your model. Those people that that are coming out, you know, that they're, they're like, you're crazy. Why am I crazy? You know, they, they don't know why they're, they're having a childhood reaction. Someone's totally. trying to take their ball away. So. So. Once you see it, you wonder, and tell me you didn't have this. Right. We've never had this. How, how did how did you ever believe in the globe? Just Doesn't sending, it amaze you that you believed in the globe? One hundred percent. Why? It's just because you or never at least looked. their accepted model of it. Like yeah. absolutely, yeah, one hundred percent. When you're a little kid, your teachers are gods, your parents mm -hmm. are gods, and yeah. the books and the, the movies and everything they're telling you, you it's just brainwashed again and again and well, again. Well, even even for me, when I had the you started to understand how much we'd been lied to on everything and how much misdirection and obfuscation there were on on various things related to health, related to history, related to all of it there was still a piece of me that clinged on to that because my, at the time, spiritual frame and perception was based in the law of one, which the law of one as a channeled material is based in the idea that there are planets with other life forms and things like this. And that was, I got to admit, a piece of my identity for a time. And then as I went into setting aside my preconceived notions, even if it flipped my paradigm upside down, continue to do that. I had to reject this idea that there are, let, there's no proof. There's no evidence for it. Let me, let me strengthen the law of one for you. Cause the law of one is a great, great thing. It's really, it, it is. Really I, I haven't thrown the baby out the bathwater no, no, on no, that. But, but, right. but again, planet plane with a T at the end. Weird. Okay. And, if you understand how the the flat earth is, we're not a disc floating in a heliocentric world. You know, you can see the meme, you know, the flat earth and the globes. Are they all flat or why are we the only flat one? And yeah. they're going to show you a, a heliocentric solar system with a flat pancake earth. Neither two, two, two fake ideas together. Google flat earth images. You're going to see that flat earth society image of the disc with the water falling off the edge or the yeah, turn absurd. up, you know, all nonsense. No, all absurd. So again, straw manning the flat earth is the only way that you can promote the globe. Just think of the flat earth as this. Imagine in Kansas, it's very flat and there's a lake a hundred miles across. That's a big lake, a hundred miles across, right? At the center of that lake is a giant mountain, a mountain, and it's magnetic. It's a, just a giant neodymium magnet mountain. And then there's a whole bunch of islands in the lake and you're out there sailing around. If you're 50 miles from the shore, so you're 50 miles from the center. You're not going to see anything. You're going to feel you're going to be in the middle of the ocean, right? This is just a hundred miles across, right? You're going to be in the middle of the ocean. You take out your compass. It's going to point towards the middle of that lake. You say, you know what? I'm going to go west. And as you go west, you have to keep turning to the right because that north needle has to point to the right. But that turn is going to be unperceivable to you especially at noon right. when the sun's up high and you're gonna go and you're gonna keep going west and you're gonna end up right back to where you started from at whatever little island you're at this lake is a globe 
<laughs> okay. You circumnavigated the lake by dead reckoning west. You can do it east also. Right. Funny thing is, billions of people have circumnavigated the earth east and west. Guess how many have done it south? Zero. 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 Okay. Zero. Zero. Well, I can go from Santiago up to Canada, across the North Pole, actually not across the North Pole, but close to it, and end up over in China. Okay, keep going. Now you've gone to China, you've gone to Australia. Well, Australia's over to the left a little bit. You keep going. You're not going to come back to where you started from right. because you're going out. So now take that pond. So so you're on the pond in uh, in this, this lake in Kansas and you sail in a straight line. You don't follow the compass. You're going to hit the edge of the pond soon. The edge of the pond is Antarctica. Why don't you fall off the flat earth? No, you're going to step up onto the land. The land's higher than the water. The land is containing the water. Mm -hmm. Water at rest needs containment. All right. So now you're going to start walking away from the lake. You pull up your kayak and you uh, or your sailboat, whatever. And you start walking. You're a mile from this lake. Can you see it? Think of that. This is a small scale mm -hmm. of the flat earth. You're a mile. You're not even going to see the lake anymore. Mm -hmm. Let's say you walk 10 miles, 20 miles, and you come to another lake. It's another piece of the plane. A planet. Extra terrestrial. Extra territory. Extra, extra land. But yeah. it's a piece of the plane, which would be a planet, a mm -hmm. plane net. OK, so so now let's say there's these ponds are all over the place. We're not even out of Kansas yet. Right. OK, that's just a hundred mile lake. You know, th so Antarctica, what we call Antarctica, could be 10 to the 36 times bigger than all of the surface area that we're aware of. <laughs> OK, yeah, right. <laughs> right. We don't know how big we it is. Know. Is exactly. that infinitely large, by the way? Yeah, it's it's un yeah, inconceivable. Right. right. So there are your planets. Put the law of one on there. Put Star Trek on there. Put the the Star Wars on there. All of that. All of the travel in between those ponds. That's interplanetary travel. You know, it's interesting, too. If you look up the definition of terrestrial, it means of the Earth. Right. So extra of the Earth. Extra, extra terra, terrestrial. Extra land. Yeah. Extra land. Yeah. So here's, here's another thing. When you look at anything in the distance, it becomes spherical. Mm -hmm. Okay? I have a, I'll show you a train video where... I, I blew it. I You're looking down in the dark and I say, is that the moon or the sun? And I was like, well, that's the moon. That's the sun. It's actually a train. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as the train comes to you, you realize it's not even a round light. There's eight different lights, triangle lights, square lights. It's like they're in all They've different. All just into it, one and they all light. just merge into a ball. Right. So if you are a globe earther, which you're not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't edit that out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and I'm a flat earther and we get on to a rocket, something that's going to take us. Let's say we, we had access to fly beyond where we're allowed to fly. As we take off, that local light is going to light up just part of the earth. Right. Because light attenuates through the atmosphere and you just it just it's like can't travel. Like if, if I held a light close to the floor, it's going to light up a part of the floor. The other part of the floor is dark. And then the atmosphere is going to feed. It's just going to take all that light away. Right. So as we went away, you would see a ball. Hey, we're leaving the earth. Mm -hmm. And then you'd, there'd be another sun over on another pond and you would see us approaching another ball. And as we got there, we just went from one planet to another. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, we just went from one pond to another. Mm -hmm. It's the paradigm that you're brainwashed with right. is what you see. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I want to move on from the law of one, okay. but just an interesting point as I was reconciling the two is that even in the law of one, the entity that's being channeled, and I'm skeptical of channeling, like very, very, very skeptical of channeling. I think a lot of people are claiming to channel and they're actually channeling something that's very negative. But again, there's they're a lot of back something though. They're channeling something okay, though. Okay. Yeah. But, but when it comes to the law of one, I, I could share this at another time. I've had my own stories where it has changed my life for the better, let's say. But the point is that even the entity Ra that is being channeled in the law of one fully says multiple times that he or they are being filtered through the subconscious mind of the individual that right. is acting as the channel. So if it, she's already been indoctrinated to believe the, word, the globe, they don't channel in words, they channel with information. Right. 
and then he's filtered putting it into his words, right? And it's right? filtered through the subconscious of the individual right. in which they're. And so, through. so you're if you were passing the information of our space our space rocket trip, you would be saying we left the globe. I can right. see the curvature right. and everything, and I'd be like, we left the flat disc right. and you know, right. the, the, the right. flat palm, right. and, and it's because that's those are the words that you have to describe what right. you're seeing. Right. Exactly. Okay. You, funny you brought up Kansas because. We, we didn't touch on the distance between cities on a non-globe, but a lot of um, proponents of the globe will say that on a flat map, on, on most of the flat maps, it doesn't, like the, the distance between cities, the scale does not make any sense. I'm sure you've come across this before. Well, uh, you know, people ask me on my app on the Friend Finder, why am I using a globe map? And uh, the answer is because that's what they can they they offer us as far as GPS location, the ground mm -hmm. positioning system GPS, by the way. Right. And um, so we don't even have verification of um, one continent's relationship exactly to others. Like we don't know where Santiago and Brazil point compared to Africa and Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can't verify that. And they, they hide the flat earth with magnetic declination. Mm -hmm. What's magnetic declination? Hey, my compass says that north is that way, but the magnetic declination for this area says that it's 40 degrees that way. Mm -hmm. So you have to ignore what your physical compass is telling you and move your north 40 degrees to south. There are places in Antarctica where the magnetic declination is over 170 degrees. What? So your compass says north is that way, but according to the NASA book, north is that way, the opposite direction. Interesting. Okay? We have sailors that have done the Antarctic sailboat race that circumnavigates Antarctica, which it doesn't, okay? Um, that have said, this is how they're hiding the flat earth. Now, there's lectures on it uh, in the circumnavigation section on my app, flatearthdave.com. Um, check those videos out. These are videos that you will never find on your own. And here's the other thing. I forgot to say this at the beginning. Don't believe anything I say. Verify everything. Verify everything. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Like I, I used to just ban people from even suggesting that I look at flat earth. You're no longer allowed to listen to our conspiracy podcast because you're an idiot, right? That's you're, what you had before and you were, and you I, were I, a deep inside the rabbit hole. We were looking into the New York event, the Connecticut event, the Boston yeah. event and everything else. And people said, Dave, have you looked into flat earth? And I was like, delete that message. And then it kept annoying me. I'm like, you're banned, you're banned. And then I came up, you know, by the way, I invented ban for life. Okay. <laughs> ban for life. Right. If you comment just like a just a globe head comment, ban for life. I love questions. I love hard questions. Right. I love I love all the hard questions. But if you're if you're just attacking people, attacking, just doing stupid things, you're just banned for life. And if you suggest stupid things like looking into flat earth, you're banned for life. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then Sophia Smallstorm, friend of mine, she did 9-11 mysteries unraveling Sandy Hook and. And she's like, Dave, I think the earth might be flat. And I was like, are you kidding me? You too? And she sent me a couple of videos. Now, people are like, oh, where do you get your information from? YouTube, right? YouTube is just like life. It has everything. Right. It has assholes. It has smart stuff. It has dumb stuff. It has right. good stuff. It has useless stuff. It has nonsense. You have to filter it out. It's just a hosting site. So, right. And, but now it's a hosting site that barely lets you say anything. Right. But, I'm on my second YouTube channel. So yeah. Yeah. The problem is we have to stay on YouTube because that's where the normies are. I know. The, I the, know, the, I know. the other people on the other platforms are already woken up. Right. Right. Anyone that's already awake to flat earth, I'm not focusing on you. <laughs> right, <laughs> I'm done right, with you. Right. <laughs> you're, right. you're on your own. Right. Right. So I, so I watched these videos. I said, okay, I need to debunk this. Right. I, and I went in with a, you know, you, when someone tells you something new, you're like, hmm, let me check that out. Right. You go in with an open mind. I went in with a closed mind. Earth is a globe. Flat earth is stupid. And I'm going to prove it. Right. right? for two weeks i'm dying but luckily for me back in 2014 youtube was like oh you like that video here watch this someone uploaded this and they're great suggestions never happens anymore right now you just get nonsense like if you said to me dave can you send me something on circumnavigation i sent you my uh, circumnavigation for dummies video it's four minutes long easy wheezy right you watch it the next video that's going to come up is going to be an anti-flat earth 
totally distracting right. nonsense video. But if you send it from the app, from the playlist to somebody, if you send it to me, I'm going to send you that video in a playlist. That way, when you're done with it and you're scratching your head, the next video is going to play. And you're like, what? Uh, and the next video is going to play. And you're like, what? Brilliant. So the app works that way where we bypass the the algorithm. So that's how I woke up. And then, uh, and then at my podcast, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to mention this on my podcast because. I'm going to get canceled by my, I'm going to lose everybody. Uh -huh. right? I almost lost my co-hosts. Oh, right? And so then I was like, you know what? I can't be quiet. This is the truth. This is the foundation of all of the lies, right? We can debug, you know, vac um, you know, the vaxes and we can, we can debunk, uh, you germ know, theory. we go to the germ, th don't debunk germ theory and government corruption and pedophilia and all of that stuff. None of it's really going to go away and stop until people know where they're standing, who they are, the true power that they have. If you're spinning out of control, lost in space in a godless or distant God deluded universe, as my co-host Matt Long says on the Flat Earth podcast, if you want to dilute something, pour it into a bigger container like mm. empty space. So you want to dilute, create, dilute creation, you pour it in an infinitely expanding universe. For Bitcoin. How much is the universe expanding every second? <laughs> according to them, according to the quote scientific community, I don't even know. I'm sure it's some it's insane so stupid. number. You know, I, I I keep meaning to look it up, but it doesn't matter. It's either every second, every minute, or every hour, or maybe even every day. I think it's like billions of miles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Does it matter that it's every day or every second? There's yeah. no difference. I'm sure they have a really, really strong direct evidence to validate that. There's claim. no one. None. Wait a minute. <laughs> we have to go on one other thing. All right. We're going to be here. For just, I have so many questions. We're going to go over five hours. Okay, Last okay, thing. Okay, okay. Right? And it might cover one of the things you're talking about. Okay. They tell us Polaris, our North Star, is, yeah. is um, 46 times bigger than our sun. Uh -huh. So remember, we're talking about scaling and variance. Yeah. 46 times bigger. All right. So our sun is 93 million miles away. If Polaris was 93 million miles times, wait a minute, how am I saying this? I'm saying, I'm saying, I'll explain it in an easier way. If our sun was a mile over our head, it would fill the entire sky, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a giant yoga ball. We're on a marble, right? right? And it's, it's a fraction of an inch over that marble. You look up, it's the entire sun. Move it 93 million miles away. It's the size of a coin held at arm's length. Double that distance, it's a quarter. Double that distance, it's now four times farther, it's a 64th. Double that distance, it's now eight times farther, it's the size of a star. Mm -hmm. Okay? It would be questionable whether you could see it. They say the sun is eight light minutes away. So eight times eight is 64. We'll call it a light hour. At a light hour, the sun is the size of a star. What if it's two hours away? Could you see it? What if it's four hours light hours away? Could you see it? What if it's eight? What if it's 24 light hours away? Okay. One light day. It's provable that its angular size is too small. Forget even the brightness issue. It's too small to see it one light day away. Polaris, 46 times bigger. Make it 46 light days away. Round up two light months. At two light months away, you could not see Polaris. It's too small and too dim. Interesting. Two light months away. Let's round up to a light year. Okay. Just yeah. to be safe. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Glober can't even argue. You could not see it at a light day, at a light year away. But you know how far, they saying you know how far that the, away like they say the, it is? The light is traveling, but to, what's also interesting because the light is allegedly traveling through a vacuum. But the other thing is too, is that the, the, what we're seeing from these stars is quote old light. That is. Yeah. That's what the, the cool story, right? Yeah. It, it right. you know, the scientists just saw a star that is a, uh, 13 billion light years away. Yeah. Wait a minute. The universe didn't start then. Yeah. Wait a minute. How did it get here? Like right, right, right. It, it's, it's so, it's just so fantastical, but finishing on Polaris, Polaris is 433 light years away. You couldn't see it at a light two months away. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. But, but we're supposed to believe that we can see it 433 light years away and the brightness, it would have to be like a billion times brighter than the sun. For us to see it and, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I'm underestimating. It might be like a hundred trillion times brighter. Um, you could not see it. No scientist has ever, no astronomer has ever seen a star, anything other than a point of light in the sky. That it's, is the only definitive thing that you can say about a star. 
it's a point of light in the sky. You know, it's so interesting, especially as it relates to the possibility, let's say, of waters above. And I, I know you know this. I'm just sharing this for the audience is when you zoom in on, let's say, like a Nikon, is it the P1000, P1, which there's some interesting stuff happening with that too. But the Nikon P1000, you zoom in on any of these stars, it literally looks like cymatics of light in water. They all have their own personality. They're all amazingly different. Um, there's there's some great footage. Like, look at it and you just feel the the angelic spirit. You know, I think uh, when Neil deGrasse Tyson, the actor, says... Um, we're all made from stardust. You know, Carl Sagan said that, you know, star mm -hmm. exploded. That's why we're here. I think we do come from the stars. I think our souls are in the heavens above and that's what we see as stars. You know why stars don't move? Because they're angels and they're perfect. They don't need to move. My wife is going to love hearing that because we've talked about that quite a bit too, how stars like are, we're projections of stars essentially. Right. Yeah. Remember, it's, it's a wonderful a life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they come from the star. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So they always tell us, they always tell us. It's uh, very interesting. They always give us little pieces of truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So back to, cause you brought up Kansas. I'm, okay. I was born and uh, raised primarily in Kansas. Um, Kansas is super flat. So when it comes to line of sight, um, you know, there's, there is countless examples of people falsifying the alleged curvature of the earth and seeing objects far beyond what they should be able to see based on the accepted globe math. And, uh, of course, people that are proponents of the globe will just claim refraction, which is also interesting because there's examples both over water and not over water, examples in the desert, examples in, in high humidity, irrespective of the atmospheric or weather conditions people have shown over and over and over again that they can see things well beyond what they should be able to see. But with that, with that being said, why is it, because this is what a lot of GLOW people say, well, okay, I would love to see you zoom in on, let's say, Wichita, Kansas from Kansas City. How come you can't see Wichita, Kansas from Kansas City with a telescope then? Yeah. So it, it, it's a very common question. It's one question I asked, and it's very, very simple answer. Light as it goes through the medium of our atmos, it attenuates. It cannot go that far. So there's a famous spot in Illusion, France, where um, you can look out over the ocean and Canigou Mountain, which is 175 miles away, um, cannot be seen. And if you use the globe math based on that elevation, you know, because the higher up we are, the farther you can see. So you have to use the globe Earth calculator, the curvature calculator. Um, the top of Mount Canigou should be about a mile below the curve of the Earth. And you can't see it. Earth is curved. You mean mile above? A mile below, according to the globe. Okay. The top of the mountain should be hidden by a mile of oh, curvature. Okay, got it, got it, right? got it. So, you know, it, like hold a basketball halfway in front of your face, so you're looking over it, and somebody's looking at you. They can't see your nose or mouth because right. it's behind the curvature. Right, 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 right. So, you can't see it, and globers go, "Can't see it." Globe, Earth is a Earth is a globe. Up oh, the bottom of that building's missing. Earth, Earth is a globe, right? Oh. It's, not missing the next day. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, well, that's because refraction, mm -hmm. refraction, right? Right. That's it's, a, it's amazing. But um, twice a year for one or two days, the sun lines up with that viewing spot. This is what you're talking about. Okay. I remember now. And as the sun goes beyond the mountain, perspective makes it look like it's going behind it. And it, you can see the outline of the mountain right in the sun. Now, the, 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 you don't see me right now. You see the light that's bouncing off of me. Prove it by turning all the lights off. You can, don't see me. Mm -hmm. You can't see Mount Kanagu because the light that bounces off Mount Kanagu isn't strong enough to push 175 miles through the soup of the atmosphere. But the sun is much brighter. And as the sun goes behind it, it blocks it. Mm -hmm. It blocks it. Now, the Glober answer for this, ready? Ready to put on your gymnastic suits because here, here it goes, <laughs> right? Is, well, the mountain is below the curve and the sun is also below the curve, but the sunlight is refracting up and the mountain, which has no light on it because it's on the dark side, is refracting up and blocking the refracted sun. And it's all stopping exactly at eye level. It never goes higher than eye level. Well, this is the other thing that was interesting to me, too, as I was looking into these refraction claims 
even with that, wouldn't these objects still be bending away from us? Well, they, based they, on the, the curve argument as well? for that is that it's it's such a slight delay thing that you might not even notice if you're standing next okay. to it. It's such it's so again mental gymnastics. Yeah. It's so stupid. Now they love to say flat earthers love the formula eight inches per mile squared, right? Which is a parabola. Yeah, it is a parabola. Yeah, right. But Which for me, those watching, what we're talking about is that means it would be like this. Like, it, it makes a it makes a small it makes a curve and then it gets drops it gets off, a, it, right. it gets dropped off really fast yeah. but the problem is up to a thousand miles it works perfectly mm -hmm. after a thousand miles it actually leans in favor of the globe and it, it says it's less curved than it mm -hmm. is after a thousand miles it, it, it starts going off you cannot see a thousand miles through the atmosphere mm -hmm. okay you were talking about a world record photo we have another photo um, of the alps from 700 miles away now the Globers the, won't even address this photo, but um, you know the the amateur people that you know that are defending the globe just because they're so hypnotized and they feel the need to, to you know try to hold onto their ball is um they say that they, you didn't calculate for the height of the mountain. The flat earthers don't ha calculate for the height of the observer. Yes, we do. We use their globe Earth curve calculator. Um. And we calculate for it, and the top these these there's like eight mountains that we can see, and they should all be over fifty miles below the curve, but they're all there, and they happen to refract up and just stop at eye level, mm -hmm. right? Refraction is amazing that it doesn't send things higher than eye level. <laughs> right. It sends things. It says refraction is here to trick you into the Earth being flat, right? And then refraction, you know, different heat, different um. Humidity has different refraction um, amounts. There on the on the there's a guy named Walter Bislin, and then and, and uh, then there's also a debunking site, uh, Mick West. These are just you know Mick horrible de you know anti flat earthers. He's got a Earth curve calculator on there, and you say, okay, I'm looking at this building or this mountain, whatever X number of miles away from X height, and it says it should be um, you know a mile below the curve. All right, but I can see it. So you take the refraction slide and you slide it over, you slide it over and up oh, there it is. Stop. There's that's the amount of refraction. Mm -hmm. They literally have a magic slider and you keep sliding it until you see what you observe. And then you say, that's how much refraction is, because that's what the refraction <laughs> thing says. And you can see it. Therefore, Earth is a globe. It's so stupid. That's insane. It's so insane. Yeah. It's ridiculous. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider sharing it with at least one friend or family member who you think could benefit from hearing it. You help us grow and reach more people by sharing it with those around you. Also, be sure to head to the show notes to check out our membership offerings, membership marketplace, and more. In nearly all cases with modern health systems, you're waiting months for appointments only to spend a mere 10 minutes with a doctor who quickly hands out a generic diagnosis that is likely rooted in a total misunderstanding of health and causes, and then you're offered a one-size-fits-all medication or invasive treatments with unpleasant side effects. If this sounds all too familiar, consider a different approach with the New Biology Clinic founded by Dr. Tom Cowan, a respected natural health doctor, author, and speaker. Dr. Cowan's holistic perspective on health and wellness and a deep understanding of the true nature of health and disease sets this clinic apart. With the new biology clinic, it's not about quick fixes and suppressing symptoms. The practitioners take time to understand your unique story, recognizing that health is unique to the individual and that illnesses have a variety of causes, physically and metaphysically. Members of the new biology clinic enjoy a flat monthly fee that includes a range of valuable services like health consults as needed, practitioner-led live streams on diverse health topics, access to a members-only resource library, and multiple live group sessions every month. These sessions cover fitness, breathing integration, biofield tuning, guided meditation, EFT tapping, and much more. Unlike traditional healthcare systems that thrive on frequent visits, prescriptions, treatments, and suppressing symptoms, the New Biology Clinic's motivation is to make you healthy and keep you that way. Visit newbiologyclinic.com to learn more and use code the way forward for $50 off your account activation. If you're a member of the way forward, email hello at the way to receive $150 off your account activation. Your journey to genuine healing begins here. 
If you're listening to or watching the show, chances are you probably look out at the state of the world and think, I know there is a much better way of doing things. So many of us have a vision of living off-grid with like-minded people, unschooling kids together, building community together, trading and bartering together, growing food together, and sourcing clean, spring-fed water together. And with modern society headed towards the cliff of tyranny and the centralization of power, it's important to consider a life where we can thrive irrespective of what happens with the rest of society. Most of us know what we want and why we want it, but few have cracked the code on how to achieve it. Our friend Jonathan England has cracked the code on the how. On August 3rd, he is hosting the Off Grid Dream Life event where he'll show you the four steps to transform your vision of an idyllic eco village into a reality. Imagine being a part of a sovereign community with its own food, water, shelter, energy, currency system possibly, allowing you to live in harmony with nature and with each other. No more bills, fresh clean water right out of the ground, organic food picked off the land daily, and surrounded with like-minded people who share your values. If this sounds like your dream, please register for this free virtual event by visiting offgriddreamlife.com or just head to the link in the show notes to learn more. So the the other one, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on radio waves because from my understanding, there's countless examples because as, as we know, or from my understanding, let's say radio waves only work based on line of sight. So radio Micro, wave, microwaves. Yeah. 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 So there are countless examples of spots picking up on microwaves or radio waves well beyond what they should be able to because they should be beyond the curve. Do you have anything so interesting the, the globers to that? claim that the 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 radio waves, the microwaves, they bounce off the ionosphere. That's how they skip around the globe, mm-hmm. right? Skimming down. Cool story, bro. Where have they ever demonstrated that? Um, that well, it because it, it, off the because, well, because because the Earth is a globe, therefore we're we, we're we're talking to somebody that is. 50 miles below the curve. Therefore it must be skipping off the right. atmosphere. Yeah. This is the whole, that's the whole point <laughs> I was getting at. They already presuppose yeah. that it must be a globe. So they have to come up with a rescue device to explain something that would otherwise indicate that it is not right. so, what they say it is. But now it's a known fact. They, they this is what they say right, right. that um, a 40 megahertz microwave will skip off of the atmosphere. But 100 megahertz will not. It'll go right through it. Mm-hmm. But we've used 100 megahertz and they've gone like 10,000 miles, ridiculous amount, ridiculous distances. Not, it makes no sense. Um, a submarine at the bottom of the abyssal plain at the bottom of the ocean can see another submarine with sonar 100 miles away. There should be a mountain of dirt over a mile high between them. Mm-hmm. So you have to believe that you send that 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 uh sonar out, it goes over the mountain, goes down, hits the, the submarine, bounces back over the mountain, comes down and they can see the submarine. Why does it just bounce off the mountain? <laughs> right. Okay? Right. Ships on the ocean, the railgun can shoot other targets a hundred miles away, there should be a mountain of water six thousand six hundred feet between that between the the ship and the target. They're both on the ocean, no no height distance, right? Mm-hmm. And um, we there's a there's some videos on the we can see too far, and then the uh, on the app, um, one, one guy that actually was on those ships, and he says they don't account for Coriolis, they don't account for curvature, they just account. It's got like a four degree angle up for drop. Because, you know, as it's going, it's dropping, but it, the thing will shoot a projectile over 100 miles in just a couple of seconds. Mm. The other one I want to get into, the, the, that's sufficient for me. Hopefully the people watching and listening, that was sufficient. Um, and again, for any of these, if you want to expand upon them, go check out flatearthdave.com. Again, that's linked in the show notes. You can watch his video archives and, of course, his app as well. Like Again, yeah. the app has a daily video every day. And what yeah. I tell people is... Don't believe anything while you're having your morning tea or coffee or whatever it is. Just watch the daily video each day. It is scientifically impossible to do that for two weeks and not end up a globe (laughs) denier. That's a bold claim. It's scientifically impossible. (laughs) That's good. Okay. The other one I want to get into, and I'll preface this by saying um, a friend of mine, uh, I know on this video I'm being obscure and I keep on saying, like referring, I hate when people say, oh, a whistleblower told me this, but I just want to be clear. I'm naming people. You don't have to believe me. I don't, I don't really care. 
I'm naming people that may not want to be outed as flat earthers right now. So that's the whole point of me saying a friend of mine. So all um, of your friends, but one are flat <laughs> earthers. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, but, uh, okay. So a friend of mine that I talk to fairly, fairly regularly that lives in Australia, uh, knows someone who worked in shipping and spent some time in Antarctica during what would be the summer months in the quote or sorry the winter months in the quote northern hem- hemisphere December January and, yeah and in the win- in the summer months in the southern hemisphere right um and he spent a lot of time in Antarctica during that time not once has he ever 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 seen 24 hour sun in Antarctica right. now there's 24 hours of daylight and uh that it, hard to hard to explain without seeing the videos on it but um, you can try to pull this up in the editing. Yeah, though, yeah, but if not, check off. Co- check out Dave's coffee cup caustic, or or on the frequently asked questions page on the app. There is twenty four. There is Antarctica in the twenty four hour sun section. Watch those videos. Google is hiding them from you, um, and then make up your own mind. And then you can see. And you can do experiments. Right. You can. There's tons of places you can book a vacation in the north in Norway in Alaska with a uh, cruise companies and say, hey, we want to see the 24 hour sun. And they're like, "Whoa, you come on this cruise, come here, come this place. You'll see the 24 hour sun. There are zero places in the south that will tell you that mm-hmm. in January or December, you know, you come here and you'll see the 20. 20- None of them will say that. Mm-hmm. None of them. Weird, because if we're on a ball, tilted ball, um, there should be symmetry in right. the north and the south. Um. So we're talking about Antarctica. Oh, where where are we going? What's there a question? I I want to know what your thoughts on like the claim coming from people who. Oh, uh, the 24 hour sun. Yeah. The 24 hour sun. Yeah. So there's. Of course it makes sense uh, on a globe and a, on a flat stationary plane for the Northern hemisphere and the North pole. Right. But the quote South pole being able to have Antarctica having 24 hour sun. Yeah. So, so. There's a uh, webcams um, at uh, at some South Pole stations, which are literally just on the edge of our pond on the flat Earth, and um, we can watch the we can watch the shadows moving around and around and around, and then it jumps eight hours. They cut out eight hours every day in the winter in our in January, December, January, right in the southern summer. Just when there's the min, why why are they they cutting out? So Jaron from Jaronism Channel. Um, contacted them and they're like, oh, well, it's a bandwidth issue. You know, like, we're like, well, how about just don't film for three days and then just film for three days and use that bandwidth? Well, you know, we can't do that. You know, they make it. And they're like, how about just film it for weeks and then put it on an SD card and send it home with somebody so mm-hmm. they can take, can't do that, can't do that. But then we found some webcams in the winter, our summer, north, the southern winter. That show in the darkness, 24 hours, 20, there's no cut. There's no cut when there isn't a 20, when there shouldn't be a 24 hour sun. So, Again, what you're, so what you're saying is when in the winter months, they have enough bandwidth somehow to have 24 hours, of, but in the summer months, when, they the, don't. when the midnight sun should be up, right. they don't have enough bandwidth. Wow. Right. Yeah. So, so that's one thing. Um, what the, about the claim? Because I've seen some videos where yeah. people claim so to there's, show there, twenty-four hours. There's four videos, and um, we went through them, and we're not just saying they're fake. We're showing you that they're fake, mm-hmm. right? We're Is this showing, on your app too. Yeah, it's okay. on the app on that Great. twenty-four Antarctica and the twenty-four hour sun section, where the guy's like the guy with his watch out there, and he's like, he, and he's showing. He goes, Let, "Let's do the twenty-four hours." He walks off camera. The scene cuts, and all of a sudden, the mountain that was in the distance that didn't have any snow on it was covered with snow. Like what happened? Like I'm like, wait, wait, what happened? And then the v- video goes around, huge fisheye distortion, and it comes around, and the exact same clouds happen, and the exact same puffs of smoke that are coming out chimneys are happening. How did that happen? Right. Like, oh well, we looped it, but you know, like, why didn't you just show us the right. 24 hours? Yeah, why right? would you loop it if you're just right. trying to show 24? And then hours another one where the time. sun literally stays at the exact same height all the way around, which would mean that they're exactly at the North Pole. Right, because that's why it would remain the same distance from you, and everyone's like, "Oh my God, this is real! This is real!" I don't even have editing good editing skills. I put two more suns in that video. Yeah, <laughs> they look just as good. <laughs> They're amazing, right? And uh, that's in there too. It's just showing you. And I did that with zero budget. You know, NASA, and you know, they get eighty million dollars a day to, you know, trick the world into believing that they're insignificant on a godless ball. Oh my goodness, that's yeah. the. I feel like 
I know you did like go through this because I, I showed you what I want to talk them, about, but I, literally that's the next thing that I want to talk about. Uh, Okay. Is, is NASA and their budget? I'm not yeah. like that. That's eighty the million dollars a day, yeah. right? I don't think NASA gets eighty million dollars a day. They just get they can they don't need money because they're just the government. They just type what they want and they 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 get it. Um, NASA is a jobs program. Uh-huh. NASA is just keeping the slaves busy doing mm. stuff because <clears throat> this is a spiritual war that we're in. They don't care about money. They it's all about our energy and our, mm. our you know they want us thinking bad thoughts and having living in fear and feeding their um you know, their satanic world. Mm. Well, that, that was the thing that I was going to bring up next is there's, I don't know how many employees that work at NASA and other space agencies and other agencies that work around something related to the heliocentric model and studying it and scientific organizations and other organizations in other countries. But are you, are you claiming, and I, I know this is a rhetorical question, but are you claiming that all these people are all in on it? So we've talked to many people that work for NASA and they say they don't know what the person to the left of them is doing. Exactly. It's so compartmentalized. One of the um, old guys who was a controller in the Apollo missions has said they do so many simulations that when the real launch happens, they can't tell the difference. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. What is that? Interesting. I mean, it's right, like, okay, right. you can't tell the difference. Right. right? And, uh, you know, when the, when the moon landings thing happened, it, it came back, it went to Australia, then it went somewhere else. And then it went to NASA and right. then it went to a rear projection screen and the, and the news media had to film the screen. Right. Okay. To get rid of all the metadata. Right. It, it's, it's, it's so NASA is the easiest one to get through. I know. And, and yeah. you know what I love about this is that like both Globers and non-Globers alike, they can, most people at this point, thank God, can at least get behind NASA being Not, like, not insane. most. There's a lot that aren't. A lot I, of, I mean, you, people say, I, I'm saying in my 20, audience. Wait until 2025. We're going, we're going to the back moon. To, we're going, we're back, going back, to back to the moon. <laughs> yeah. No, we're not. Well, so I, some of the crazy things like <laughs> them, quote, recording over the the unedited they, footage the of the greatest, moon landing. <laughs> human feet they recorded over it because they were short on videotape okay and the and all of the data that with all the calculations for all of the orbits and everything which are so stupid were done by one woman in pencil on a stack of paper that was six feet tall yeah and she, right. they lost it for the most important yeah feet in human history up and to this all point. of the computers don't even add up to a crappy Android phone, let alone <laughs> right. my wristwatch probably has more data in it. Okay. But then they also claim, oh, we, we lost the technology. We lost like, the this technology. advanced technology that we yeah. have. And uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's so silly. It's a, but, but getting back to the, the lie, what, what, JAXA and, and all these other space agencies, NASA is a money laundering um controlling your population organization and they literally franchise it to other countries like mm-hmm. hey you can rip off your country by doing this and and make right. them more subservient and and respecting you and i think they're all they're all in on it together they're all doing it together because at it's, the tippy top at the tippy top because yeah. like the people that work yeah. for nasa and these other agencies There's, they're just doing the job that's in front of them and they don't know any different if they say that i don't know how many people work for nasa but they say there's a hundred thousand i say there's ten thousand okay okay so they're first they're lying to you the population of the world the population that you know works for nasa it's way less than what they're telling us mm-hmm. it's way less than what they're telling us well the, the other thing that comes up for me though is that so we have all these you know, supposed vehicles, rockets, telescopes that are supposed to be floating in space. So are you saying that like all of those are totally fake and there's no way that they're actually where they say they are? So there's the Google Loon program and the NASA balloons. They have tens of thousands of satellites that weigh up to 8,000 pounds floating on balloons, balloons, some of them bigger than football stadiums, Mm -hmm. right? They're up there. It's not a lie. They have it. They just don't advertise it. They don't tell you about it because that's what satellites are, right? On the saddleoons, right? Saddleoons. So on and the on the frequently asked questions page of my app, there's a satellite section. Watch that. Well, Dave, what about what about uh, Elon Musk? His um, Starlink. I've seen across the sky. Have you seen Starlink go by? Absolutely. Yeah, multiple times. So what you're seeing, <laughs> what you're seeing is a bunch of lights. What are they? I don't know if they're drones, if they're airplanes. If what they're, if they're using some form of electrostatics to in order to keep them in that position? Well, so, so 
just to know that they're, I don't know what they are. Right. That's fine. Right. Right. Falsification is independent of replacements. Right. right? So let's falsify it. A, a, um, Starlink drone is about the size of a office desk, Mm -hmm. a school, a kid's school desk, let's say not that big at all. Okay. The engine on a 747 could probably hold 15 or 20 of those desks inside of it. Okay. When you're looking up at a 747 at cruising altitude, you can see the plane. Can't really see the engines, Mm -hmm. right? Maybe a little bit, maybe, right? It's too small. If you doubled the height, it's at five miles. If you doubled it to 10 miles, cruising altitude, about five miles, doubled it to 10 miles. Could you even see the airplane? Probably not. Definitely couldn't see the engine. Remember, the engine is 30 times bigger Mm. than a Starlink satellite. So that's 10 miles. You can't see something 30 times bigger than a Starlink satellite. Do you know how high they tell us Starlink satellites are? How high? 350 miles away. Wow. And you can see them very clearly with, with your, your naked, naked eye. eye. Clearly, right. now, any I, I want more people to do this. A couple people have, have done it. Um, when you, if you're in a quiet place and all of a sudden you see the Starlink satellites, be quiet and listen. You'll hear a jet fighter way in front of them and a jet fighter way behind them. Interesting. To me, there's something low, and these jet fighters are in case some guy, Joe Schmo, in his Cessna goes, "What are those lights?" And they, I want to go over there. <sighs> He'll be intercepted and stopped. Interesting. Another thing that people have noticed is when you're looking up at them, sometimes stars to the left and to the right of them disappear. Like, what's that? Now, it could be a cloud that you just don't see. Right. Or maybe these are lights on bottom of an airship. Mm-hmm. And the airship is kind of blocking Has anyone the taken sky. a telescope and zoomed in on them? Have you seen any footage of that? It's at night. It's a light. There's not anything else to see except a point of light in the sky. You're not yeah. really getting anything other than the light that's that's on yeah. these things. Yeah. I think what we're seeing here is just um, a deception. It's not mm-hmm. anything useful. But Dave, I have Starlink service. I get Wi-Fi on my boat in the middle of the ocean. Yes, you do. Let me explain how that happens. Okay. My satellite phone works. What's that connecting to, Dave? Right. Satellite phones work. What's a satellite? Right. So everyone understands how cell phones work. You have these towers all over the place that have a radius. They send out a signal on a radius. And now they're all close enough where all of those circles intersect each other. And you have a flawless area. I drove from South Jersey home two hours. I was on a call the whole way. Never lost a signal. Never heard a click. Nothing. It was beautiful. Great technology. What if I was standing still and all of those towers were moving in unison? still work right Mm -hmm. it would still work what if that tower was 10 times high it would have much bigger radius we need Mm -hmm. less towers if they could be 10 times high what does a what does a cell phone tower need to work it needs a lot of electricity a good amount of electricity it's got to be powered up we've got satellites floating in a vacuum where's it getting all this electricity from Mm -hmm. how's it repowering itself they also need to be serviced right space is harsh Right, you need you need technicians to serve. Some things break. And there's what like over six thousand supposedly satellites that are all orbiting each other and never bump into each other too. It's like thirty thousand or six thousand, they can't make up their mind. Yeah. Okay. Right. But there's there's a good global argument for that. You know, like if if, if thirty thousand grains of sand were flying over the ocean, would any of them ever hit each other? Okay. You know, whatever. Fair point. Fair it, point. It, it, I'll 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 steel man the globe argument for you. But um, so you need electricity. You need them to be everywhere and you need them to be able to be serviced. What already has, and they need to be high enough to reach. Now, 350 miles, that's tough. When when Neil, um, when uh, Felix Baumgarten did his space, bowl, space jump, he only went up 20 miles. Mm. Was it, it might have been less than that. And they were losing communication with him at 20 miles. They could barely communicate with him. So how do we get some cell towers? that are higher than regular cell towers floating in the air. Answer, commercial airliners. They're everywhere. Your satellite phone can easily find a commercial airliner in the fly in the sky, and it could relay you to an actual tower. So I'm in the middle of the ocean. I'm in the middle of the jungle. My cell is my my satellite phone is just a strong powered cell phone 
that can reach that airplane. That airplane can relay to another airplane to a, to a, ta- a ground tower, and then you can go anywhere in the world because it goes through all of the regular cables, undersea cables. That's what satellite phones and Starlink is. Now, the Ukraine war. Ukraine's very bad. Elon's a very good man. He said, you know what? I'm turning off Starlink because of this war. That's the first thing he said when the war started. Why is that? No fly zone over the Ukraine. (laughs) That's interesting. If they're not doing satellite phones like that, they're irresponsibly, fiscally irresponsible because it's cheaper, better, faster, and the other stuff's just fake and gay anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> but is it still possible that these lights, whatever they are, that are coming across the sky that I've seen these chain how, of lights, you, it, you like, rarely it, see them. Right, so that's like, true. Like, like how, where, how can, like where where are the rest of them? Why, right. How come it's just it's that's just a, a trick? Point. Why would they go to all of this expense to trick it? Trick as I said earlier, the heliocentric deception, the helio sinister trick is to keep us disconnected from the creator. Yeah. It's to keep us lost in space, spinning out of control, helpless and, uh, helpless and scared, and asking to, for our minds to be controlled by the government. Well, of course, you have to control. continue appealing to authority right. because your own observations and experience tell you otherwise. Why are all of those blue dots on my friend finder on the app unvaccinated? <laughs> because they've unplugged from the Helio Sinister trick and they can now see reality. Mm. You're Neo. Morpheus, I'm Morpheus. I'm trying to unplug you. Once you're unplugged, you'll look back and go, how did I ever believe all of that nonsense? Mm. Okay, next ones. Um, What about uh, the International Space Station? Because The IFS? Well, yes, the International (laughs) Fake Station. But I've seen- I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Well, I've seen it through a telescope myself. Yeah. yeah. You saw it. What did you see? I, I saw a, thing. a light. Yeah. A light. You saw a light. Yeah. You didn't see the space station. You saw a light. Yeah, I saw a light. Okay. Yeah. So I was communicating with a NASA whistleblower um, via email and he verified who he was. And, um, you know, could I be scammed? Maybe. But it would, he said, you can ask me anything you want. I'll answer the best I can. I'm fleeing the country right now. Right? Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, back and forth, and we we're asking him all sorts of stuff. We said, what's the, uh, what a, when, when you have your ISS tracker, I've seen that. It's like, hey, it's coming up at, you know, 816 tonight. And I'm, I'm standing on top of the hill with my buddy. We got our telescope out. 816. Bam, there it is. It went from horizon to horizon. Okay. And in just like seven minutes it took, you know, that's pretty fast. And it was brighter than Jupiter. Interesting. The International Space Station is just a little bit bigger than a 747. 747 of cruising altitude of five miles is the size of a a racer held at arm's length, a pencil eraser, mm-hmm. right? Maybe smaller. The International Space Station is 50 times farther away. <laughs> 50. Okay. And and at 17,500 miles an hour, I have to believe that I'm looking at that thing thousands of miles away, let alone 50 times higher than an airplane, and I can still see it with my naked eye, mm. and it's still as bright as the sun. The whistleblower said that they do that with five different modified, I think it's B-2 bombers, where they've totally modified it, where part of it is transparent, like transparent material with thin metal struts that you just can't see and the entire bottom is surfaced with leds that match the sunlight interesting and there's five of them two of them are based in alaska one of them's in russia and i forget where the other two are and that's how sometimes you're watching and you're looking it says it's visible it's visible it's visible and then all of a sudden it's not visible like what happened to it how come nobody can see it right did they turn off their lights to go get fuel if that's even a thing another Mm. another rabbit hole (laughs) (laughs) All right. Okay. That, that answers so, my So but but what it is, remember falsification is right. independent of replacement. I prove that you cannot see something 50 times farther than a than a 747 reflecting light as bright as the sun and traveling 3000 miles while remaining in your eyesight. It's not what they're telling us. Whatever right. it is, it's small. Now, they, they it transits the sun and the moon, and they, that's another parlor trick, mm-hmm. right? They got something else that doesn't have lights on it mm-hmm. that goes, and they can, they can triangulate and say, hey, we know it's going to go right here, and if you film the moon, you'll be able to see it. Another parlor trick to make you believe you're insignificant living on a, you know, a ball flying through 
in scientifically impossible fake space. A, a real quick layman's example <laughs> on the falsification uh, doesn't require replacement is if someone tried to say that I murdered someone else and I showed them all of the evidence, all of the evidence that, nope, I was at home. Here's video footage of me at home. Here's like all the evidence required to, to falsify this idea that I murdered someone else. That doesn't require that I help them figure out who did murder. Before they that, can prove your innocence. Right. right. Yeah, like if I show them all the evidence that, <laughs> no, it clearly wasn't me, thus falsifying their claim yeah. that I was the murderer. It's not that, well, you know, even though you have all that evidence to falsify mine, it's the best fit model we have right now until you find someone else. You, we're going with you as a murderer. That's not how it works. It's it, it, once right. you and falsify that, and- their claim... That doesn't mean that you have to come up with a better replacement. Although, again, when it comes to any of these things, we have other another ideas. example that Austin Whitsitt and Jaron from Jaronism use is um, you live your whole life, your your family, mom and dad, and everything's good. And then one day while they were away, um, you were going through their papers and you found your adoption papers, all signed, stamped, sealed, filed. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm adopted. And you go to your best friend and you say, look, it's not my mother. I'm adopted. And your friend goes. Well, then who are your parents? You're like, I don't know. I'm not going to believe it until, until, until you, until you know, right. It's the same thing. Right. You have the proof, right? The proof is it's ridiculous, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's scientifically impossible. Falsifying you can't see claims, it. Right. There right. you go. Okay. So the other one related to NASA real quick, and then I want to get into a lot of uh, stuff related to sunsets, sunrises, and some more stuff on. Sunsets uh, are the best. Yeah. The yeah, sunsets prove flat earth, but okay. go ahead. <laughs> um, is pictures of space, pictures of planets. We've touched on that a little bit. Pictures on other planets, uh, live feed footage from space going, we discussed going to the moon a little bit. Um, and, and we've already discussed satellites. So let's, let's just talk all the supposed images and videos of space. Let's start with images of the earth, like the, these, uh, blue marble yeah. images of the earth. So the, the first blue marble, the first blue marble was put on, was it put on everyone? The iPhone was the first one or the second one? Everyone that's new iPhones that had the blue marble on it. And when you look at it, the clouds are photoshopped. You can just see the United States and part of South America. All of the other world is on the other side. Right. Okay. Just think about it. It doesn't work. Then the then the, um, there's the 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 blue marble shot supposedly taken from the moon or when the when they were leaving the moon, right? And we could just see Africa. There's literally just Africa. Well, we know exactly when that was taken, and the according to the time and date, uh, a whole bunch of other area of the Earth was lit. But they're just showing us this, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that's not a real photo. Mm. Then uh, you look at the continent sizes. Um, the America is twice the size. USA is twice the size in the 2012 shot than it was in the the previous shot before that. And then if you measure- I've done that myself where you yeah. literally look on NASA.com forward slash whatever, yeah. the official blue marble image versus, of one year versus another year and the relative yeah. size of some of the continents on one versus the other. And then again, if you zoom in, you can find little Photoshop clouds and things like this right. yourself. You can literally do this yourself. They showed us um like a 2000 and one versus 2017 shot of the earth and the earth was much darker. Mm-hmm. And they're like, this is from global dimming from pollution. <laughs> and actually I was like, Oh my, that's a, you know, I, I, I actually I think it was before that. I forget what, I okay. forget the dates. Maybe it was a, um, before that, but you look at it, the clouds are exactly the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How did that happen? Right. So again, are they that stupid or are they doing this on purpose? Yeah. Like okay. mocking. Yeah. yeah. Are they yeah. mocking? I don't know. Yeah. What about pictures of other planets and pick, well, again, let me be clear, images of other planets and images of on yeah, other planets. They're, they're, you know, they can't get a, they admit, NASA admits they don't have any real photographs of Earth that right. aren't saddle stitched together. Saddle right. stitched. They say that they're composite yeah. images. But they have yeah. a full shot of Mercury, I mean, of Pluto as they're whizzing by at 60,000 miles an hour <laughs> and they transmitted it home in 4K from, a, from something else. What about all si- the ones of Earth? If, they are, yeah. if they're getting all these clear pictures yeah. of other places, where's the one, like crystal clear <laughs> one of earth that yeah, is a so picture you, you know what's funny image. is um everyone says what about the himawari 8 and the himawari 9 japanese satellite it sends a real-time picture back every 15 minutes okay let's look into that um well it's every 15 minutes but there's a 20 minute delay so something's happening to that picture that they're sending in 20 minutes <clears throat> um some whistleblower sent us a link to a nasa ftp server with 
tens of thousands of folders all dated on them. And we started looking in those folders. And in them, we found all of the cloud data from radar worldwide. Um, we found in one folder the blue marble flat blue marble and how they wrap it on a globe. They wrap the cloud data on it and then they add the Terminator line. Mm. And so we found the actual proof of them faking every single Himawari photograph with real cloud data. Remember those thousand balloons twice a day? Yeah. So those balloons and the radar supercomputer says, here it is, lay it across the earth, wrap it around a sphere, put a Terminator line on it, darken it. And we even have the transition. They show the whole globe and then they show the, the half the globe is dark, right? So we only see a, like a quarter globe. How did they get the pictures that the, the clouds in the dark? If it was in the, the they couldn't have done that. 100% without a doubt proving that they're faking these. We've made a video. It's in the satellite section and the frequently asked questions page on the app. And they just ignore it. They just pretend it didn't happen. They just pretend it didn't happen. That 700 mile shot, they pretend it doesn't exist. The, the faking, the catching them faking and layering the 24 hour sun. They just, they, they actually, we pointed it out. Right. Globers that are out defending the globe, you know, the anti flat earthers, they should be like, hey, yeah, let's audit NASA, because if they believe in NASA, let's audit NASA. Right. Let's get together and find the truth. They protect NASA. Right. They protect NASA. Right. So the they came out and admitted that they faked that video. And now they just pretend it never happened. My goodness. Well, let's talk now about the supposed footage or video footage from the International Space Station doing spacewalks looking at Earth or uh, the the video footage of people um, like the Red Bull footage of uh, the guy, I forget how many feet up he was. 120,000, 127,000, I think. And, and some like of that. these people who are claiming to have seen curvature at that height or video footage claiming to show curvature. Because one interesting thing that I'll bring up before you start, and I know you're going to go much deeper than me, is there's one set of videos coming from Chinese, quote, spacewalks that show very clearly at the supposed same height as U.S. spacewalks that it is totally flat from their perspective. Yeah. But at the same exact height from the U.S. spacewalks Curve. or the Russian spacewalks, yeah. it looks... But curved. when Elon sent his Tesla into space, the, he was only... 70 miles up uh -huh. and you can see the whole curve, the whole curved earth. <laughs> right. right <laughs> okay. Right, right. Right. So come on. So who's lying? Like <laughs> everyone's lying. Everyone's exactly, lying. Exactly. Right. I show eight pictures <laughs> of, um, of the globe from, from NASA, uh -huh. eight different pictures. They're all completely different artists. Right. right? right. And the answer, and I say one of the, I don't know. No, seven of these are fake or all eight are fake. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So it's, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Although that's what they constantly do. Um, so pictures of other planets are just CGI. Let, look up latest picture of Pluto. I'll, I'll give it to you. Latest picture of Pluto. Um, it has the dog. Pluto on it, the cutout of the dog Pluto. Have you ever seen that? No. <laughs> so For NASA's real? picture of Pluto we'll have, has we'll have, the we'll dog have, we'll have Pluto on it, right? And yeah. uh, again, in my uh, in the in the app, you just go to the images section and you type in Pluto. And we'll have we'll have Nico throw yeah. this one up. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And the desert is shaped like the dog Pluto. Did you know that Pluto the planet and Pluto the dog were created in the same year? That's interesting. Okay. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, yeah, yeah, the video. That's great. That's right? great. It's just weird. Yeah, it's it just is. weird. It's funny. All right. All right. The next thing that I want to get into is just related to the lights in the sky, our um, relationship to them and how that works. Because one of the... I'd say the two primary things that I came across that brought up a lot of questions for me that almost made me throw out uh, the the geocentric model or the geocentric position is the Southern Cross and then also sunrises and sunsets. And then the third one would be uh, lunar eclipses. So let's 
talk the Southern Cross first. And for those who are unfamiliar, according to those who defend the globe, the Southern Cross is direct evidence that we are on a globe because it's a, I won't say fixed point in the sky, fixed constellation, but it's a relatively, according to them, fixed constellation in the Southern Hemisphere that can only be seen in the Southern Hemisphere that is fixed, which would indicate that we're on a ball because the only way that could work according to them is if we were on a ball for those stars to be in the same position, relatively speaking. So, so let me get this straight. You want to talk about gas in a space vacuum that collapses upon itself. That's impossible sizes and distances and the motion in your <laughs> sky to prove the shape of the floor that you're standing on. Is that what you want to talk about? <laughs> hey, I'm not, this is not me. Sid. This that is, is you. You right. wrote that question down. <laughs> I wrote the question down because that's what you wrote up. it down. I know that it's an affirming the consequent fallacy. So for those who are familiar with what an affirming the consequent is, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's essentially, um, if X, then Y, Y, therefore X, uh, as an example, I talk about this with virology quite a bit. If there is a, a virus, then it'll cause illness. I have illness, therefore it's proof of a virus. The only way that that can be not logically fallacious or logically sound rather, the only way that that can be logically sound is if the only possible, the only possible well-established cause of Y is established to be X. Yes. So the point that I'm getting at here is that that's what they claim. They claim right. that there's only one possible meaning for yep. this effect that we notice, you know, yeah. in the quote Southern Hemisphere of the Southern Cross. Well, the only possible explanation yeah. is X, according to what they say. So that's yeah. that's what I'm leaving up to you now. <laughs> yeah. So they're, not they're, my claim. So the Southern Star Trail, the Southern Star Motion is um is a great topic, and there's a lot of unknowns, but there's a lot of ways, uh, a lot of things that can be happening. One one theory is that. That there's really only northern stars out to the tro- out to the um to the tropics. In between the tropics, we have all of the zodiacs, and then everything else is a reflection hmm. from the inner northern stars. And the correlations I've seen are right up there. They're they're quite amazing, right? Um, so where those lights are coming from. I don't know, but there's also, uh, there's many experiments that are done that can show, well, if the, if the stars are rotating in the North, the reflection in the South would be coming an opposite reflection, huh. right? And that's what actually reflecting off of, though? off of the dome. Oh, okay. Right. Um, there's four, there's, f- there could be four different rotations going on outside there again. There's a there's a YouTube channel which is called Tube of Illumination in the Flat Earth Sun Moon and Zodiac Clock app. In the frequently asked questions page, there's Southern Star rotation. There are tons of videos in there that you will never find on Google. Right? Watch them, and you'd be like, "Hey, that makes sense. That makes sense." Get a dinner plate, you know, something with something with a disc with a pattern on it, and stand in front of a mirror and rotate it clockwise. The one on the mirror is rotating in the opposite direction. Mm. Does that mean it's a sphere? No, that means it's that that's a reflection of that. Okay. Right. Also, no matter where you are in the Earth, all of the luminaries, sun, moon, and stars rise in the east, set in the west, mm. and even if something is Going in a straight line, level over the earth, you're going to see it at the horizon. It's going to go high over your head, and then it's going to go back down to the horizon, right? You watch a chemtrail on the sky. It looks like it's going straight up or straight down. It's really just flying straight and level. Yeah. Right? And yeah, you showed some interesting things on some videos I've seen of yours and also your uh, presentation at Anarchapulco, which was incredible, where based on your perspective of something it's going to look like it's now we're kind of getting into right. sunrise and sunset. It's going to look like it's setting right. based so on perspective. The, the one video that Google is going to feed you is that you can see the, um, you can see the Southern cross at the same time from Australia, from South America and from South Africa. Well, that's a lie because when it's noon in South Africa and you can't see the Southern star, those cross it's midnight in Australia. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, well, how does that work on a flat earth? Well, the sun is just going around. Um, but at all three of those locations at midnight, you can see the Southern Cross. You know why? Because the stars are rotating above us, mm-hmm. right? Mickelson and Morley t- did the measurement, you know, was measuring, uh, is there a 15 degree per hour rotation? And when they did their measurements, um, it came out to a different amount. 
Mm-hmm. It what it didn't it didn't show what it would calculate. And you know, Mickens and Mor- Morley was was um they had to throw out the ether to get rid of the the null result there. But um if the earth is spinning and orbiting and traveling through the ether, all of those motions would be measurable. But the only motion they measured was a rotation. And it wasn't the rotation that's necessary for the globe. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Well, that means that it's the sky that's rotating. The mm-hmm. lights in the sky are rotating. And it all works on a Taurus field. Um, it all makes sense that all of that stuff is all in a Taurus field. Mm-hmm. Again, you got that's one that takes time. On the app, in the homeschool section, schooling Glober section, find the section on the Taurus field and the star rotations. And um, you'll be hooked forever. Once you start seeing this, it is the most fascinating, mind consuming, always learning topic there is. Got it. So, and in, then in, again, you have a whole section on your and, app. That and by the way, into- there's only 20 minutes of one day per year that all three of those locations can actually see the Southern Cross at the same time. But are they all looking opposite directions or are they all looking? towards the same point south mm. and it's an apparent point also so they might not even be looking at the same thing at mm-hmm. the same time or they're looking at the same thing in a different position at the same time right and again falsification does not require a replacement and also affirming the consequent is claiming that the effect is proof of cause unless you have established very clearly that that can be the only possible uh, way that that effect is apparent um, okay. <clears throat> the other one is based on sunrises and sunsets. So, um, and this one goes with the perspective thing that you've shown before you've demonstrated yeah. with like some, ex- like very, right. very easy elementary experience, like right. with a table, like putting your eye level, you know, with a table and seeing an object move further away, right. it looks like it's setting. And then it gets to a point where you can no longer see it anymore. And then you've talked about atmospheric conditions, being able to not see something after a certain distance. So, um, yeah, if you could just expand upon that according to, cause you know, glo- people who are defenders of the globe will say that sunsets are impossible on a flat earth. Right. Right. Exactly. So the horizon is always appears at your apparent eye level. The horizon does not rise to your eye level. It appears to mm-hmm. be at your eye level. Everything goes to that vanishing horizontal eye zone, mm-hmm. the horizon, zone, right? Not the curve eye zone, the horizon, zone, right? <laughs> so go out on a cumulus cloud day if they, they're not spraying and uh, dissolving all the clouds and you'll see that cloud deck just sitting there, right? And so let's say the clouds are I don't know, 10,000 feet above you. Um, you look into the distance 20 miles away, they look like they're touching the water. Like if you live on the water in Kansas, it looks like they're touching the earth. So they merge together. Now you can zoom in with a telescope or a P1000 and open that up and see farther, but your eyes will see them merge together. Right. Okay. Now, there could be mountains in the distance, a city skyline and clouds, all of them merge into your eye level. Is that at your eye level? No, it's not. Mm-hmm. It's still on a flat earth, still thousands, thousands of feet above your head mm-hmm. if there's mountains, right? But it all looks like it's at eye level. The sun is just above that layer. And as it goes away, it looks like it due to perspective. It just goes beyond it. It just goes beyond it. And it looks like it's setting. Right. It's not going down. I remember in art class, we did very like elementary things. Uh, and this was in high school or middle school, where if we wanted to make thing, give things perspective and depth, we would start with a central point and then draw everything from everything there. Comes like out of c- that point. Cityscapes, if you're standing on a street, yep. you would draw everything to a central fixed point. That's how we art, see. That's how we see. That's exactly. how we see. It's amazing. Yeah. It all, it all just goes to that point. Convergence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. This one. This one, I still grab. Remember, I said on. no tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, only softballs. Right? No, no, he did not say that. He absolutely. Oh, no, I actually that. did say that, but I wasn't. I was kidding. Yeah, you were. To- <laughs> well, you said that, but you're. I mean, I what I did is I messaged my Telegram channel. I messaged uh, in in this men's group chat that I'm in, which has several people in there who are dead set on flat Earth being a psyop, and I said, please give me the best questions you have Go to ask, it. and that's what I'm going on right now. So, um. The other one is lunar eclipses. That one still puzzles me. So I'd love to hear 
your falsification is know, independent know, of know, replacement. Know, so what is a lunar eclipse? You want to describe it to me or you want me to describe it? So according to what the Heliocentrism. Okay, you describe it because I bet you're more well-versed in their arguments than <laughs> so I. So you have, you have your sun, mm -hmm. your light, you have your moon, and the earth is in the middle. Mm -hmm. And when the earth gets in the perfect syzygy alignment, it casts its shadow on the moon, mm -hmm. right? Have you ever tried to cast a shadow of a basketball 20 feet across a wall? It, it just disappears. Mm -hmm. If the sun's above your head, put a ball on the ground that has a perfect shadow, lift it over your head. Where did the shadow go? Mm -hmm. It just dissolves. But we can send a shadow of the earth a quarter of a million miles away, and it makes a perfect curve, okay? That's not even the problem. The earth has to be in alignment with the sun and the moon. So if you're wherever you are on the globe, it's your, you're always on the top, mm -hmm. right? Cause that, that's how you're, you're on the top. If you can see off your left shoulder, the moon above the horizon and the sun off your right shoulder above the horizon, isn't it? Could an eclipse be happening? They're both above the horizon. Mm -hmm. That means you're not in alignment with them yet. That's a very good point. Okay. There's been over 50 documented, lunar eclipses where the observer can see the sun and the moon above the horizon and to make it worse the shadow comes in from the top of the moon wait if we're below it, it should come in from the bottom but the shadow comes in from the top from the observer sees the shadow come in from the top what does that prove how eclipses are done nope it proves that it's not the earth doing it hmm. okay that's called a selenillion eclipse. Okay. It's hard to say selenillion. So you know what the scientists call it? The mm. astronomers call it? They call it the impossible eclipse. Because they can't explain it, but it happens. Right. And that's as far as they go. Wow. Interesting. Okay. No, it's upsetting. It's not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's upsetting. Well, okay. I'm kidding. Um, but so, so that, what, what so do you think is happening? Then? Another thing and again, is again, you're speculating. Yeah, so, yeah. What, and, what do you think? just another thing is when you take a ball and cast a shadow onto another ball, it comes in as an ellipse. It spreads out to a circle and then it leaves as an ellipse. Mm -hmm. But when we watch an eclipse of a ball, it's a perfect curved shadow that comes across it, mm -hmm. right? Then it turns red for some reason. Well, that's the atmosphere and the refraction, right? Um, if you take a single source light and a ball and take a straight edge, like a book or something, and, and eclipse that light, you get the same looking shadow as we would during an eclipse. I'm not saying that's happening. I'm just saying there's one thing that it could mm -hmm. be, but I don't even think it's something that's blocking the the light. I don't think, I think... <clears throat> I think the moon is its own light, as I said, mm -hmm. which we can prove. It's bright. It casts your shadow. You do the inverse square law of light at 100 miles away. The moon should be like 60 times brighter than the sun for us to see it at the brightness that we see it. It's just you can't imagine what the sun is at twice right. its brightness. Right. So all of that stuff is nonsense. What is the eclipse of the moon? It's some phasing of the moon. Um you know, electrically, something magnetically, it's something, right? Yeah, it's okay. something. Well, what about like how they claim that? I'm sure this ties into the Sarah cycle that we touched on earlier. What about the, the George Soros cycle? Yeah, the George Soros cycle. <laughs> um, that the uh, the moon or lunar eclipses can uh, be uh, tracked and and predicted well in advance. So can solar. Mm -hmm. They both have their eclipse cycles that repeat again. I'm and talking again. about with the heliocentric model, though. The, the heliocentric model. Do you know where um the, the all the eclipses information comes from? Hmm. A guy named I, I can't remember his name now because now you got me stuck on Soros. Uh, NASA gets all of their. It says it right on their website. All eclipse data comes from. Edward something. It's some guy okay. that does it for them. And he uses the Soros cycle. Okay. It's not, it's it, the, 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 the cycle of the eclipse is not exclusive to globe or right. flat. Yep. It's just a cycle over thousands of years has been tracked and monitored so they can predict what's coming next. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see the, and again, the, the idea of the sun and the moon for a solar eclipse lining up perfectly, you know, all of the time, you know, again and again and again is infinitesimally impossible. Okay. Got it. We, we touched on sunsets a little bit, but I want to talk about that as it relates to, 
uh, the sun appearing larger as it's setting because the idea on a flat stationary plane is yeah. that the sun is moving away. So it should be looking smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Why does it appear larger oftentimes as it's setting? So as, as we talked about in the car, there's always more than one explanation. So there there's when you're, so you have to look at the flat earth and then you have the layer of atmosphere and then you have space above that. Mm-hmm. So when you're looking straight up, you're looking through this little layer. Mm-hmm. When you look at four, and let's call that layer one unit, one right. length, one layer, whatever. And when you're looking 45 degrees forward, that angle, you're probably looking through three or four times that distance. And then when you get lower, you're looking through infinite times more because it's just pure atmosphere. Right. Okay. The atmosphere has moisture in it. And it magnifies what you're seeing in the distance. Different on different days. Sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's smaller. That's one of the things that's going on. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's going on, it's an illusion in your head. What do you mean, Dave? It's an illusion. You ever see a giant full moon when it's rising? Wow, look at that moon. Then you take a picture of it and you're like, look at the picture. It's tiny. Right. Right? Next time you see a giant full moon, turn around backwards bend over and look at the moon between your legs upside down and it will be small. So what's happening there? Your brain is short circuiting (laughs) and that's how it sees things, right? I have this, there's a famous video that's on TikTok and everywhere of this girl in a car and she's filming this building and it's really big. And as she drives towards it, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I actually have that at my town park on my beach. There's this, Stanford Hospital, it's gigantic as you're looking down this tunneled street. And as you go down it, you know, the the tunnel with the trees, I mean. So it's just an optical illusion. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's so small. I'm like, how did it get so small? It was gigantic back there. I'm getting closer. Okay. Right. So that's one thing. But it doesn't always happen. We have videos. Again, where does the sun go on the Frequently Asked Questions page of the app where the sun does get smaller? The sun will go down, 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 down. And then it stops Mm -hmm. and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and it never goes below. It never goes below on a clear, dry day. I also have a film. I I filmed it seven times with my drone. You have to film it in 4K, super cold, zero humidity, super clear. Like, Dave, how come you're the only one that's filmed this? Because I'm the only idiot that's going to stand out in the freezing cold and film the sun even when it looks like it's already gone, right? Yeah. And I filmed the sun. I'd watch it would be going down, 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 which is just getting farther and farther right. away. Again, the, the, and then when it gets right to that horizon, if there's no clouds for it to go behind, atmospheric deck of opacity, it shrinks until all of a sudden it's getting dimmer and dimmer because it's getting farther and farther. And then it just fades out. It's a whole section on the app called the sun fade out. And now lots of people have filmed this. Oh, wow. So you were one of the first ones and then other people have filmed it too. And it's the sun fade out. Don't watch it if you don't want to be a flat earther. (laughs) Okay, good. Um, Okay, here's one that was submitted specifically by someone in my channel. Okay. How do the flat earthers explain different sunrise times for places that have same longitude? As of today, uh, May 29th in Perth, Western Australia, Southern Hemisphere, and then Denpasar, Bali at 6.26 a.m. So the 7.07 a.m. in Australia, 6.26 a.m., almost the equator. And then Beijing, China, 4.49 a.m., Northern Hemisphere, all 115 degrees. As of about 4 p.m. their time today, the sun's altitude was 12 degrees elevation for Perth, 24 degrees Denpasar, and 36 degrees Beijing. How is that possible with the flat earth theory? So that's a lot of numbers. But essentially what they're getting at is that um, how do how do sunrises based on different perspectives across the Earth make sense on a flat model in the southern hemisphere? Are you, these all at the same latitude, longitude? Same longitude. Same longitude. Yeah, and they rise at different times. Yeah, it's so simple. It's it's so simple. It's because. The sun is close. The sun moves north and south in between the tropics. So when it's, let's say it's over the Tropic of Capricorn, which is as far south as it goes, it's closer to people that are underneath it. Mm -hmm. And when we're up here in the north, it's farther away. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So it's going to rise at a completely different time. OK. I mean, that is a complete lack of understanding of the model to ask that question. Right. All right. Time zones prove flat Earth. Did you know how many time zones are there? I honestly don't know. 24? You know Twenty-four. Twenty. Well, that's what we're taught. Twenty four. OK. So on a globe, you have your North Pole, your South Pole, and you draw a line from the North Pole to the South Pole. That's the longitude line. And then the next one, there are 24 of them, like sections of an orange. Mm -hmm. And as the Earth spins, wherever the sun is over, it's noon in that time zone. Right. Okay. That's how it works. Did you know that there's 18 time zones in the North inside the Tropic of Cancer? No. There's 24 time zones between the Tropic and Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. That's the tropics. And there's 32 time zones south of the Tropic of Capricorn. And that's according to NASA. their claims. No way. NASA. World, so there's, yeah. there's, there's less time zones in the, quote, then, northern hemisphere than there are yeah. in the southern hemisphere. Now, now think about this. What? Yeah. And they say, well, it's for political reasons. Nonsense. Take that. Take that. You got a circle of paper. You draw your, your, your time zones in the middle. It has 18 slices of pie, 24 okay. slices of pie, right. and 32 slices of pie. And then wrap that around a basketball. What's going to happen? The middle ones need to stretch out. The top ones need to stretch out the middle. The other ones will wrap around nicely, and then the rest is going to get crumpled. You're going to have to get rid of some of those, mm -hmm. right, to make your ball. But the time zones ref don't reflect that. Mm -hmm. Time zones prove flat Earth. Do you know what else proves flat Earth? Mm. Everything. <laughs> Can you? Okay, here, here's, here's the thing that I struggle with related to the idea of proof. By the way, frequently asked questions section on the app, time <laughs> zone button. I, I, wait, here's the thing. I wish I can give the app away for free to everybody. It costs five figures a month to, to run that app and everything. Right. I don't, it's not about that. I don't care. I want people to learn, right? I want people to learn. I want people to find other unjabbed flat earthers out <laughs> there. It's a, it brings you together. It's got a dating feature on it now or friend finder. <laughs> it's great. got a matchmaker. It's got a meetup maker. It's got all sorts of stuff, video calls. It does everything. Go read the reviews. Don't buy the app. Just go read the reviews. Got it. All right. There you go. Well, okay. Re related to proof though, right? Because I look at um, people pointing to effects as proof of cause uh, and, and it bothers me. Can can we really say that this is proof of flat earth or what the, this indicates a flat earth? Which thing? So what, like what you just said about time zones. Well, I'm just saying it goes into the only works on a flat earth. Okay. So they, 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 this basket. can only possibly. Yeah. But, but we can see too far. So mm. I was just recently on um, the Jesse Lee Peterson show. Oh my Lordy Lord. Okay. Oh my Lord. I was afraid at the beginning you were going to say, Dave, I have a question for you. Are you absolutely positive without a doubt? <laughs> check out my channel, D I T R H and check out the Jesse Lee Peterson. I put it You'll in three minutes. Yeah, it's three minutes. I, I took his our hour interview and brought it down to three minutes for you. Oh, that's so good. Um, th does that 700 mile video, the, the photograph prove um, the earth is flat? It's either flat or way bigger or a million times bigger than they tell us. Right. Okay. If it's a million times bigger, that means there's seven or eight million continents. Right. Okay. What are all wars fought over? They're fought over land, land resources, resources and, and money. therefore power. Yeah. Right. What if they're hiding more land? What if they're hiding more land? Right. We have to, and we have to, at some point, they have to touch on the ships out through Antarctica. Yeah, okay. okay. Talk about we'll, we'll touch on that. Okay. So the, the next question I have, and, I, and I've thought about this as it relates to, let's say terrain based health. So ironically, what led me to the terrain based health position is setting aside my preconceived notions. I had already woken up to the idea that vaccines are bad and totally unnecessary. But at this time, my wife and I both thought that her previous quote autoimmune conditions were caused in part by Epstein Barr virus. So coming into the terrain based health position, ergo uh, throwing away the idea that Epstein-Barr virus even exists required that I set aside my preconceived notions. And now I have landed in this train-based health, health, train health perspective and have sort of, sort of deepened this position and I speak on it. I'm invited to speak on it. And I would be lying if I said to some degree I haven't formed somewhat of an identity around the train-based health perspective, but I am aware of it, right? So it would be really, really hard to convince me otherwise. But I do think that if someone 
showed me an example of, let's say, a virus being isolated, characterized, uh, isolated, purified, characterized, and sequenced directly from the fluids of a sick person, and then demonstrating a very clear causal link between said virus and a you know healthy person and subsequent uh, illness in them, or someone showing that fluids from a sick person cause disease in a healthy person. I would think that hopefully I would come around to that. But again, it would be really hard for me not to because to some degree, I have to admit, I have formed somewhat of an identity around a trained-based health perspective. I'd be lying if I said otherwise. So the question that I'm getting at is, do you think that to some degree you've formed an identity around the flat earth topic and would it be really hard for you if someone showed you evidence? Like, let's say, I don't know, like maybe sometime, this is all, again, hypothetical, probably totally not possible. But let's say 10 years from now, people uh, can be sent up in $5 flights to uh, outer space. That's what they claim. And you're like, oh, let's see if this is real. And you do it and you actually see the globe. Yeah. So have I identified? Sure. My, my, I'm Flat Earth Dave, okay? And, <laughs> sure. and I, I quit my own career, my own company. I was making lots of money. Right. I literally dropped everything, you know, um, some relationships and, and all sorts of stuff because I feel that this message is a very, very important message. Like, you're doing this drain thing. Why? For money? No, no, you're doing, dude. I, I majored in systems engineering and yeah. went to West Point. Yeah, like, yeah. I can't make <laughs> no, no, so I got much you. more money. Listen, I had my own business. <laughs> right, right, I had right, my right, own know, like very same business. Right. <laughs> I, 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 we're doing this because it needs to be done. I wouldn't be interviewing you if yeah. I was in this for the money because I already know that this is like the this, <laughs> this is will be the topic your number it, one rated show. This will be your highest. One, viewed agree, show. but this is also the one that it gets you easy. Like, oh, he's a flat earther. Yeah. Like, oh, no way. I don't. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, sure. But here's the thing, you know, you, you flat earthers, you'll never change your mind. That's what we get. No, we were Globers. We changed our mind right. based on new information. At this point, I can't imagine, I can't foresee a possible way that, uh, that m new information could come out that will show us otherwise. Right mm -hmm. now there's a, um, you know, people like, what about the 24 hour sun in Antarctica? It's not there. It, it's not there. Now, going to Antarctica, it, it's it's a costly thing, a timely thing, and the chances that there will be clear sky are less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what are we seeing? You know, Could we be tricked with something there? Maybe. Um, I don't know, but there's other experiments that we can do. You know, I, I have an experiment that I can be fully funded for less than $100,000, and it'll absolutely prove it to anybody that puts their mind to it. So um, those are things that I'd like to fund, uh, you know, eventually. And uh, what think, are some examples? Well, well, th th the, the one that I want to do is um, it's called a vertical gyro. So airplanes fly straight and level because they have a gyro that's hold rigidity in space. It's on three axes. So no matter how the airplane turns, the gyro holds levelness to where they took off from. Okay. So when you fly halfway around the earth, the gyro should be sideways to the earth, but it's not. It's always level to the earth, which doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And then the globers say, well, the gyros have pendulous veins. Well, they didn't used to, and they worked, and now they do. And they, you know, it's like, it's ridiculous. But my gyro is <clears throat> a straight up gyro. You mm -hmm. spin it up, oriented east and west. Okay. And then you say, okay, this direction is west. I'm going to use the gyro and fly the airplane west. Well, on a, on a, the, if you, if you fly straight west, should peel off to the right mm -hmm. because you're going around that circle, that right. northern circle, right? And it will peel off to the right. The problem is that doesn't prove the flatter globe because it's the same on both. Got it. In the north, in the south. West should peel off to the left mm -hmm. and it won't. It'll peel off to the right. Which means that the, the earth is flat. You're right. Right. And that okay. we're going because it should peel off to the left because on a ball, you have right. to keep turning to yep. maintain that latitude line. Right. Right. People are like, planes don't turn. Globers even said that. We're like, yes, they do. They have to, even on a globe. Mm -hmm. Right. So circumnavigation, east and west, work on a globe and a flat earth. Peeling off to the right of a gyro compass works on a flat earth and a globe earth. But south of the equator, 
It only works on a flat earth and that's what will happen. So I just need an airplane. I need to get scientists and camera crews down to South America. And then we need a nice big airplane, DC-9, maybe bigger, and film it and do it. And then we could also, the Globers will go, well, the gyro didn't hold its rigidity because it's rotating with whatever. They'll make up an excuse. And we can prove that's not true by flying north and south with a gyro. And north and south will not change. Mm -hmm. It will not drift because north and south are straight lines. Right, right. Right? So- it's a little complicated for someone that it hasn't looked into flat earth, but once you look at it and understand what I just said, it's very simple. Yeah, that, that makes sense. The other thing related to planes that I actually want to talk about, there's two things that I forget, forgot to mention. There's so many, there's so many things to touch Flight on. routes. Flight routes, but then also flying east to west versus uh, west to east and the time it takes, especially as it relates to... Uh, the Coriolis effect. Yeah. So I want I want to touch on that. Well, that you're mixing you're missing effects with spin and Coriolis. Coriolis is something else. But so the Earth is a basketball. See, this is what's so great is you can defend the globe arguments. Oh, I, yeah, I can defend. <laughs> okay, the globe. you, you yeah. do. Okay. So the ahead. Earth is a basketball and it's spinning. Yeah. Right. It's it's spinning, and all of the air is velcroed with gravity because it grabs it. Gravity right. and the whole thing, and it's spinning with it. Mm -hmm. Now the higher up you go. The faster that air has to move in miles per hour just to keep up with that point on the earth because it's got to make a bigger circle. Right. Right. So what would happen as the earth is spinning, the higher up air, would it start lagging behind? Mm hmm. Seems like it would. Right. Unless the gravity and the friction of the air against the air. The, you know why they say the atmosphere spins with the earth? Because it has been for so long. Because the friction of the mountains and the hills and valleys has made all of the air spin with the earth. Yeah, that makes sense. And summer breezes can blow right. air left and right. And right. hurricanes, right? right? So that air would drop, drift back. So the earth is spinning to the east, mm -hmm. right? The sun is stationary. The earth is spinning to the east, so the sun will rise and set in the west. This is what the heliocentric model is. Did you know at 40,000 feet, the air is outrunning the spin of the earth to the east. So not as the air lagging behind, like we just decided that it would, it's outrunning the spin of the earth. We send balloons up in some places and they land in front of where, whoops, they land in front of where they should be. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Nothing. And, and, and oftentimes also, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong on this, when you send an object up, right? Yeah. And if you send it straight back down, it lands in literally There are identicals. examples of a cannon shooting straight up and the cannonball going right back into the cannon, right? Yeah. Well, that's because the globe will say, well, that's because it was moving with the earth and it went up and it wasn't in there. That How long. is that locked to the earth? But then this air in this atmosphere is outrunning it. It's outrunning it. Right. Outrunning if, if it, it is, if it is right. gra uh, locked yeah. based on gravitational pull, how is it that the air yeah. is outrunning it and then these right. other objects aren't? Right. And how come some, some like in this, this relates to, as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Coriolis effect to some degree as well. Coriolis is different. Coriolis okay. is if you're on the equator and you shoot something, a cannonball um, directly north, right? The Coriolis, the, the cannonball. You're supposed to be, have to account for the Coriolis effect in order to determine which location you want the cannonball to land. Nobody ever accounts for Coriolis. Right. <laughs> they say it. Uh -huh. Maybe some books say I got to go look because I was a field artillery officer and yeah. I threw away all my books because yeah, I, yeah. I, I because they know you, you 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 don't account for coils yeah. you count for wind yeah. you account for you know we count, account for deflection yeah. wind yeah and I, drop, I know that I, right. I just, but the Coriolis, yeah. I mean, think about it. You're under fire. Someone's going to kill you. You got 10 seconds and you're like, well, I'm this far off the equator. I'm shooting at this well, angle. A lot of it's automated now, but, but yeah, they say point. it's automated and there's a book and it's, kind of, it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. I got to go look. The I longest, go my the wrong, longest rifle shot is four and a half miles. Just happened last year. And, um, Jaron called, uh, called the guy, reached out to the guys and said, did, uh, how did you calculate, you know, for Coriolis? Like, we didn't. Yeah. Four and a half miles. Yeah. Did you got to go there for Coriolis? Okay. I, I wonder if it's, I, I got to go look I, again. I don't remember, but I got to go look in and see on my field artillery books. If it's one of those examples of <clears throat> something being inserted into a mathematical equation that is then subtracted out later on or divided Probably. out later on. Cause um, I, I don't and remember. We have, we have many snipers um, and long distance shooters that said that, you know, in the military that said they never, ever used it. So Coriolis is you got your cannon sitting on the equator, the equator is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and you're shooting it 
north to Canada, Canada is only spinning at 500 miles an hour because right. it's making a smaller circle, right? right, right? right. So that cannonball is going to deviate to the right mm -hmm. because it's moving a thousand miles an hour. So it's going to deviate. Doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, what about storms, Dave? The storms in the north spin one way and storms in the south spin the other. That's because the wake of the sun and the moon, which are electromagnetic wake going through around the tropics, create a, a current, mm. right? Slide your hand through a body of water and you'll have counter rotating vortices on that each side. Sense. Yeah. And none of them will be in the, where your hand was. That makes sense. That totally makes sense. Okay, what are what are some other things that toilets spin backwards yeah. in uh, in Australia? Toilets spin the way that the water is going in them, right? There's uh there's some shucksters at the equator that'll show you. Look over here, the water spins to the right, and then twenty five feet to the other side of the equator, it spins the other way, and on the equator it goes straight down. It's literally they have the the way their their bins are shaped and the way they pour the water in it. It's just a scam. On the app, in the Frequently Asked Questions section, there's a Coriolis button. All of the tricks are shown there. That's good. See, everything that we're talking about here, you can just expand upon in, in Dave's app. Okay, the other one that I had is related to the Tycos model. Have you looked into that at all? Because Tycos Brahe model? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I'm not an expert on that. Okay, okay. I'm not an expert on that. Because supposedly but, that's the model that is, it, it both, it, it takes the accepted model and said, no, that's incorrect. But also the flat earth is incorrect. Here's another model that is so correct. So let, let me throw this one at you, right? This yeah. Is not I'm not looking into it either. So yeah, I, no, I, let I, me, I let know. me throw this one on you. Yeah. So all of the planets, including the earth, circle the sun. That's mm -hmm. what they tell us. Right. Okay. We orbit the sun. So our, the reason the stars spin the way they do and Polaris doesn't move is because the earth is spinning. And the axis of our spin, if you extend the North Pole all the way out, it, it goes right to Polaris. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? If I held a light over the center of a merry-go-round, a whole bunch of lights all over, but there was one right over the center, and you were on the merry-go-round spinning around, they would all be spinning around that center point, pretty much. Right. You'd have to be right in the center of the merry-go-round, because the whole thing, seeing star trails perfectly from you know off the center, right. doesn't make any sense. But let's just pretend it does. Everything orbits around the sun. So ours, our, our, po our pole points towards Polaris. Now, do all of the other poles of the other spinning planets point towards Polaris? No, they don't. Mm. Saturn actually points kind of towards the sun. Jupiter points sideways. They all point in different directions, but uh -huh. they all happen to be on the same plane, of course, somehow. But all of their things point in different directions. Mm -hmm. We're the only one that points towards Polaris. 2,000 years from now, we'll point towards someone else. Okay, According to them. Why do all of the planets and the sun and the moon and comets circle Polaris? Is that how it works? They all circle Polaris. Interesting. And they all make these loopy loops, these retrograde motions. Like oh, I know a, this, and, they, and you you overlay them, and it's actually really beautiful. It's from a beautiful my flower, it looks like of life. A flower of it's, life. It's, yeah. it's absolutely amazing. Like sacred. If you want to talk about yeah. sacred yeah. geometry, like yeah. that is a perfect example of it. Like overlaying yeah. all of the paths of the celestial bodies in the sky from the perspective of Earth. Just type in Polaris in the image section on the on the on the app, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. They all have. Polaris in the center. They all circle Polaris. How does Halley's Comet go around the Earth, leaves for 76 years, times four and a half billion miles of movement a year, and come back and find us? Mm -hmm. We've gone four and a half billion times 76 years, and then it comes back and finds us again? Well, it's moving with us, Dave. You don't understand. It's relative. It's relative, right? None of it makes any sense absurd literally absurd okay i, I want to go back to um uh the theory of relativity especially like time being relative and light being relative light bending time bending space time bending um just your thoughts on that in general so in michael and morley they they um they measured they were expecting to see a change in the speed of light because of the Earth's orbit, mm -hmm. and um, it didn't detect it. And instead of going, oh, well, it didn't detect it. Like, well, because we're going so fast and relatively, rel relative 
tell it relatively relative relativity uh-huh. oh, Rel- relativity relativity you, were, you weren't saying relative to relative to relativity okay. Okay. right <laughs> um that the device actually shrank and time slowed down right. that's why it looked like it wasn't moving right okay it's because they already presupposed that it is yeah so therefore yeah. they had to pretend that the device shrank and time slowed down mm-hmm. Can I use the word retarded? Absolutely. Okay, it's retarded. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Listen, that's not a bad word. It means slow. That someone yeah. that's a slow down. Right. My my Got engine it. on my my scooter is retarded. Got it. Got okay. It. Um, have you looked into the Bedford level experiment? Yeah. That's, okay. Des- describe that. So the Bedford level experiment. Um. Done by a character named Robotham. Who knows if it's even a true story about this guy. And there's lots of the, the, the Globers are trying to introduce him as being a heretic and a crazy man. And it doesn't matter. Why do we always look at people from hundreds and or thousands of years ago for proof of a flat earth? Why don't we just prove it today? Do Eratosthenes thing today. We can probably do it in a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. I don't have to count five 500 miles. Okay. <laughs> I can jump in a car or an airplane. Right. right. And we could, we can, we have cell phones. We could do it. We can do it with a hundred sticks mm-hmm. all across the earth. Right. So, um, the Bedford level is basically he's theorizing if the earth is curved and it's a radius at Eratos and he said there should be a certain amount of curvature at uh, six miles and he had a guy in a rowboat with a little flag and he put his camera right above the water and he saw him go all six miles and he could still see it and uh, there was no curvature. That's it. Simple experiment. Now, they have refraction, this and that. It's a liar. It's not true. We had a guy on a, on a frozen long lake now large bodies of water at rest need to be contained and they lie flat Mm. and when they're cold they freeze flat too so this guy went out at night and he got a snowmobile and he set his camera up six inches off the ice documented the whole thing and he said he had uh, four different colored, very bright lights and he put them you know uh they're about a foot above the ice and he put them at 12, no, seven, eight miles, seven miles, six miles, and five miles, right? So this guy's out there in the freezing cold, traveling at night, putting lights, filming. It's a big pain in the neck. And all of the lights lined up perfectly, one next to each other, because he put an offset them a little bit, and they all lined up perfectly. The first light would have to refract up 22 feet. The other one would have to refract up like 14 feet. The other one would have to refract up like a dozen feet. You know, they all refracted up. So this is up. disproving curvature. They, they all refracted at the perfect amount to stop at eye level. Yeah. Or maybe they were just at eye level. Right. That's the whole point. So <laughs> maybe the, the whole thing was again, flat. This, this is falsifying curvature yeah. is what you're saying. But yeah. Well, no, it's not falsifying curvature. It's proving flatness. Right. But they have but to. But it's, it's okay. But, I, but I'm because the earth is curved, claims. because the earth is curved, they have to say, well, they refracted up. <laughs> right. They refracted up. So when you look at refraction over great distances, every couple feet has to refract up a different amount than right. the foot Makes before sense. it and the foot after it. So it all. And it's ref- exponential too. It all refracts up. And stops at eye level. Yeah. Or maybe it's just eye level. Don't make it weird. Right, right. Okay, so I, I'm being more careful with what I'm saying yeah. just for the sake of this show. But that is falsifying curvature. I get what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I, is there any other, I guess, that sticks out in your mind, uh, what you would call flat earth proofs or like really good experiments that have been done to falsify the curvature or falsify gravity or things like this that we haven't touched on yet. We can see too far. That's one of my favorites. Yep. We can see too far. Countless um, examples of that. Yeah. The yep, sun I fade agree. out is one of my favorites uh, that, that I filmed. Um, we caught NASA faking, you know, faking it a million times, green screens, harnesses, wires, all sorts of stuff. Right. You know, the, the space station is probably without argument, the greatest, um, construction project ever and they forgot to film any of it there's yeah. zero footage of it and uh china just put one up there a couple years ago and they forgot to film it too okay what about the in- in- indian uh like moon, the moon landing, landing? <laughs> yeah all right right the and biggest biggest mockery ever yeah, that, that i mean like, the cartman and and uh and uh, the crew <laughs> were all laughing at that right seriously. cartman and kyle were going are you kidding me that's ridiculous <laughs> right, right. all right so it, it's so it's so dumb. They show you this landing, which is literally like Atari nineteen eighty five, <laughs> and then then they a couple of days later they show the 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 rover going out, and they actually show video of the rover, which is literally a briefcase wrapped in tin foil opened up on you know four little wheels, and uh, they're like, well that 
that's real. Yeah, that was real video versus cartoon. And they're like, well, they, they didn't have a camera there, so they had to show us a cartoon, but that was real. People are just like, it, they make something so fake that when they show you something that's real video, which we could film in this room and make right. it look better. People or are another like, oh, location real. on earth that's a hidden location yeah. that's like government land or something like that. You never know. We found in in uh, in Devon Island in Canada. Is in Canada or um, Iceland? Wherever the hell it is, Devon Island in the north. Okay. Um, the Mars Project, where they're literally testing the rover there, and it looks exactly like Mars. <laughs> and uh, they have some Google Google Pic, big Google Plex pictures there that yeah. you can zoom in on. I took some screenshots of them and put them in Google Image Search, uh-huh. and it came up as Mars. Oh, as wow. Mars rover pictures. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, what's also interesting is that Interstellar, the movie, was shot in Iceland. So that I, f- I wonder if that's like revealing the method type of thing. Like, hey, this is where we shoot yeah. some of our so-called other planet footage from. Um, which is really sad, by the way, because Interstellar was Great. one of my favorite yeah, movies. Yeah, I know, it but it all my... it all goes away. But I here's know. the thing: Star Wars. There, so there's there's a bunch of books, and they, you know, I, I highly recommend people read the Iron Republic mm-hmm. or the Smoky God, all in the book section on my app. If you forget the names, um, and there's another one that's uh, called The Navigator Who Crossed the Ice Wall, and it's about the the Nosferatan map. No, I, that's the wrong pronunciation. And it shows 178 ponds uh-huh. across a plane, uh-huh. each pond being a world bigger than ours. Wow. Right? Because our pond actually has two more outer rings, and it's still one pond. According a, to this, right? According to this, right. whatever yeah. it is. And it's about, and literally, it's the story of Star Wars, where- there's hostile areas and there's there's like the the um they call them the 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 custodians they're the ones that allow you to travel between places uh, and you have to be of a certain vibration you know a certain uh spiritual level to be able to travel and there's hostile lands and there's friendly lands and they say that all humans have um a connection to the source what does that sound like the force uh, it's the same story wow. but it's here on earth where it's physically possible versus scientifically possible negative space zero pressure gas balls f- forming gas you know right. in the both the heliocentric model you know they say lie big or go home you know lie big right it's so big it's so stupid that people can't see it mm-hmm. it's so big and so stupid the 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 people that figure it out though are all different types of people from PhDs. They're they're actually the hardest though because they're no, the most there, there's there's a recent one who just yeah. came out with a book that I'm interviewing soon. Yeah. So so there there's people like you and I. There's there's a also PhD physicists too. People which makes that cool. are you know doing you know menial jobs, factory workers. There's people all different kinds of people. I don't know what it is that you know some people just see it when they see it. You know. And I don't want to say you have to be a really smart person. You just have to be a person that uh, that gets through the programming. You have mm-hmm. to take. You have to unplug from the matrix. Yeah, you do. Well, and again, it makes it more difficult when you are looking for things on YouTube, even looking for things on Rumble that are categorized so poorly. It's really hard to find stuff. So thank God you have your app and you have these playlists and all these videos categorized and very easily searchable. That's it's, it's right. so important. Um, and another one that I wanted to ask. This is sort of getting into like I guess intense speculation because who who knows? But sure. what what are your thoughts on Admiral <clears throat> Byrd and what he claimed to have seen? So Admiral Byrd uh, in uh, early forties and fifties was uh, did Project High Jump. Now what's High Jump? High Jump is they were going over Antarctica. Why is it called High Jump? The the um, Antarctica is the highest land on Earth, right? Um, in the image search on the app, search um, highest land, and it shows you the average height of every continent. Antarctica is over double the highest, the second highest. Really? Like yeah. average elevation? Average elevation is over double of the top two. Interesting. Okay? And uh, that's the shoreline of our pond, our world pond. And um, uh, he he said, uh, you know, they lost planes. Like, did they crash into the firmament, the, the dome? And uh, he said, beyond the South Pole, there's land bigger than the United States, filled with resources that no human has ever set eyes upon. And there's warm lands, too. And then when he he did that on a news show, six months later, he's died suddenly. Something <laughs> happened. Okay. You got six the COVID months, shot. Back yeah, then. maybe. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? That's um, interesting, not making though. any claims. Um, 
Didn't he claim to go into the earth as well? Or? He, well, that's a, I think that was a made up story okay. because he's trying to figure out where the hell he was or right. they just made it up to, because to hollow, the hollow, globe. hollow earth is the same as globe earth. Right. It's still a prison. Right. Um, then, Could uh, that also be true on a flat stationary plane, though, that there are like... Oh, like I think there's inward, layers. I yeah, think there's yeah. stuff below us, stuff above like us. Even yeah. beings living below uh, absolutely. us. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I, I would bet on it. Yeah. So in the 1800s, there's a, um, a story called the Iron Republic of a, of a, uh, a New York-based politician that just got fed up with the system, sold his house, everything, had a lot of money, bought a nice big ship, got a crew, and went to Antarctica and was going around Antarctica. And then saw this inlet, like, where does this go? And then they kind of get sucked into it and they're just riding it through. And then all of a sudden they're back out in the ocean and they couldn't figure out where they were. And the stars were wrong and they were lost at sea for, I think, three months. And then finally they saw land, they saw a city. And they're like, all right, and we have to wait until morning. So they anchored off the land and a boat came out in the morning and they're like, welcome. You know, hey, we're from the, US, the United States. Where are we? Like, this is the Iron Republic. And they're like, where is that? And they said, well, it's on the other side of Antarctica, about the same distance as the United States is. They, the morning, a ship came out. And they said that they're, um, they're from the Iron Republic, the same distance from the United States. So they went in. Long story short, they went in and um, they showed them this whole land, a different type of government. They didn't have money in the same aspect. And the guy ended up falling in love and he got married and he lived there for 10 years and something happened. I think his wife died. He got distraught. He got his ship back and he made it back to Florida and he told his story and he published it in Florida magazine in a series of articles, which you cannot find a single copy of Florida magazine with those episodes in it. There's only a couple PDFs, but all of them are gone. You can find anything you want to find the first time magazine, go on eBay. It's there, right? You, you go somewhere. And um, and he supposedly had proof and everything. And so this whole thing came out. It's out called the, I'll call the Iron Republic. Here's what I'm saying. Is it true or is it not? It doesn't matter. Right. It, it rings true to me. And all the stuff. Oh, he was talking about flat screens, ca floating cars, I think. All sorts of advanced technology they had. Oh, and they also said, you know, they spoke English. Like, wait, wait a minute. Where is this? What's going on? They said, well, in the 1600s in the United States, there was tyranny and they didn't like it. So they left and they went to the outer lands and they restarted their civilization out there. Could you imagine tyranny in the United States? No, right? no way. <laughs> yeah. And so they so they went out there and um, they're like, how come you never contact you came back? They're like, why would we? You know, the, 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 it's crazy what's going on in there. And so they had this entire different civilization out there. I'm going to get we're going to get into this in a second. You're going to you're going to freak. So when I said, why does it, it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. I it rings true to me. I can't prove it being true. Right. But in the 1800s, they were talking about more land beyond Antarctica. Right. People think that we've known the Earth is flat for a long time. I interviewed Ruth in uh, 2020. 2020, um, 102 years old, and she said she was taught flat earth in Connecticut public schools in the 1920s and 30s. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. And, and it just shows how quickly, over just a couple generations, the entire yeah. you know, like modern civilization it, can be. In the 1950s, with. they were teaching flat earth and globe earth in public schools in America. Both. They didn't know. Wow. And all of a sudden, the Rockefellers... Got there, got in. The Rockefellers actually took over in the early 1900s, yeah. but it got to the point where they literally eliminated Flat Earth. They eliminated the Gleason's map out of encyclopedias, out of libraries, out of everywhere. You know, before you heard about Flat Earth, you never saw that map. Right. Whether whether they believe in it or not, you never saw it. It was hidden. It's right. hidden from you. I mean, it's the same thing with modern medicine too. Like uh, before the. Uh the what's what was the report called the uh Flex flexner flexner report. report yeah before the flexner report it was well established like the original quote western medicine was homeopathy yeah like that was quote western med medicine and osteopaths at the time were not identical to but similar to chiropractors and that they were had a very natural approach and this was like 
taught commonly and of course herbal and and uh you, you know medicines uh what word am i looking for sorry we've been going for so long uh indigenous medicines i guess is the word i'm looking for but these were like the common approaches to medicine and in just a short time over a few generations just because the rockefellers were able to get their hands in it it completely flipped completely 1902 flipped. they took over the education system right. and that they, they here's the, here's what i do overfund the military to, to depopulate the world, underfund schools so they have to sell cupcakes to buy books. Right. Right. Then control the textbooks by, you know, textbooks are expensive to make, but they sell them to the school for $5. But they cost $25 to make plus shipping. Therefore, no competitor can ever get in there right. and sell books. Right. It's like right? only McGraw Hill. I think yeah. that's like the main one. And then, uh, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. 1958 Encyclopedia Americana talks about the the dome being at 85 degrees south, being at 13,000 feet. The no dome. Way. Yeah. In, wow. in the encyclopedia. Wow. So all of this stuff is being hidden from us. So let's talk about my favorite. So first. To prove the shape of the earth, you don't need to look up in the sky higher than you can reach, and you don't need to go farther south than you're allowed, okay? You don't need to. It would be nice if we could. And we don't need to speculate what's beyond Antarctica, but I like to, right? Because it, it's good stuff. It is fun. It so is fun. There's a ship tracking websites so that you can go on, free ones, paid ones, that you can see all the cargo ships around the world, where they are, all the cruise ships, cruise ship tracker. I got one on my on my phone. Right. When I'm in Mexico, I look out the cruise ship. I look on my phone. I'm like, oh, that's the that's this. It's just interesting. Mm. Right. So you can track these things. And we saw, you know, Antarctica is a continent at the bottom of a ball. And we saw a ship. It said it was a fishing ship that was like. Uh, how far in it was? It was 900 miles inside of the shoreline of Antarctica. Unless there's like some river that they've documented that's and, super well, wide. They that also goes say all the that way inland. Yeah, it's inland. But it's frozen, so it wouldn't be frozen, possible to right. have a river. Well, right maybe there. it's global warming, right, whatever. <laughs> so so when you click on a ship, it tells you the size, where it's registered, the captain, what they're carrying, right. where they're going. It gives you all this information. We click on that ship and it said the ship is is eight hundred and fifty meters long and eighty eighty meters wide, which is giant. That's huge. Massive. Okay, yeah. so, and then all it said is was registered at the nation of Kiribati. Now it's called Karabash, but it's spelled Karabati, K A R I B A T I. Okay, okay. ever hear of that? You've talked to me about this. Okay, before, so, so you know, so most people listening, you've never heard of that. Yeah. So we were swimming in, so uh, in I, Acapulco, Mexico. Yeah. Told me so, I so I so I uh, so I um go on Google Earth and I zoom, I go zoom in and it finds it. it literally, it's zooming in, zooming in, and don't see it, and all of a sudden, there it is. It's a tiny little sandbar, and it has some weird names like Banana, Paris, London. It's got these weird names for different areas of it. Okay. Interesting sandbar. And then to do a little research, you find out that China and America, the USA, gave them $10 billion each recently. And, uh, you know, other countries, uh, Vietnam, say it's a very important trade route. Why would a giant ship have to stop at Kiribati to be a trade route? What are they picking up sand? I don't even know right. if there's enough sand to fill that ship. Okay. So interesting. So, um, there's also a bunch of other weird stuff on Kiribati at Captain Cook Hotel. You know, he's the guy to try to circumnavigate Antarctica 12,000 miles around, give or take. And he went over 68,000 miles and never completed his journey. Sounds like he's going around the outside of a flat earth pond um, rather than a little continent at the bottom. So um, Kiribati is also right on the dateline. Where time zone, you know, when we talked about time zones being like sections of an orange, the time zone zigzags across three and a half time zones. And it's in this weird little hook. It's right in the most suspicious spot. Mm -hmm. Like, what does that mean? I don't know. But it's weird again. Yeah. Right. Look up the history of Kiribati. They did tons of nuclear testing there. Well, I don't know. Does your audience know that about nuclear bombs? <laughs> okay. I'm sure half of them do. Okay. So yeah. that's another red flag. Right. What is going on here? I mean, even Rogan has covered that, which says something. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at, a, there's a map that was discovered in 
a Buddhist temple. It was published in 1910 in a, in a Hawaiian newspaper. And it shows the flat earth with all these other continents outside, around the outside. Right. Take that map, wrap it around a globe, take all those continents and say, oh, that's just one continent, icy, barren wasteland on the bottom. Right. <clears throat> so Kiribati's out in the South Pacific. If you drew that line to where it was uh, supposedly in Antarctica, it's literally going to the outer lands, mm. more land, more civilizations, more resources, maybe big ship, big See, air. And this is why when people say, what does it matter? What, Cause I used to say that even as I was I waking up, it. I was like, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Even when I woke up to the, their accepted model being totally wrong, I was like, it doesn't really matter that much. It doesn't affect me in my life. And I would say, okay, on a day to day basis, I could see that argument. There are people who it does not affect on their day to day life. It but does in the grand, everybody. But this is what I'm saying. In the <laughs> yeah. grand scheme of things, if there is possibly land beyond, maybe they're trading further further lands, fish, weapons, technology, there's, children. There's so many things. There's right. things we can't even conceive right. of that might be important related so, to this. So we had somebody that worked for a uh, like Intel chip manufacturing uh you know in the science department and they say that all they do is they take these chips and they try to make them better and they very rarely make tiny improvements to them but then all of a sudden industry says hey we need a chip that's five times faster and half the size and they're like well how are we gonna do this and then the ceo comes out and goes here use this chip just and has they, it they literally take it they reverse engineer it and they build these chips where did the chip come from? Right. Where did it come from? I, I want to tie this back to you because this, this is a uh, really interesting thread too, because um, the, the Nazis were fascinated with Antarctica, whether you adopt the globe or the, you know, the flat model, they, they were obsessed with Antarctica, right? And there's also indications that Nazis may have had some technology that was advanced that like appeared to be UFOs, which is why they had to come up with the alien cover for UFOs. Possibly. I'm sure you've gone down that rabbit hole too. But what I'm getting at here is like the possibility of technology that is far advanced in these quote other ponds. hundred percent. And and then Nazis, this was brought up to me last night and I had never heard this before. The submarines. Yeah. The submarines. How many submarines was 250,000 people or something like yeah, that? 250,000 people disappeared. And the submarines, how many submarines was it? I don't remember how many It was like a thousand or some, some, some two, crazy number of Nazi submarines yeah. disappeared yeah, headed they, towards so, so let's explain what Antarctica is. Imagine you live in a building. You were born in a building that's 500 miles wide by 500 miles long. 300 stories tall. tall yeah. that, I don't think there's any buildings that tall. Right. So that's pretty darn big. And you're born kind of near the middle, halfway mm. to the middle. That's hundreds of miles from the outer wall. Yeah. So you're living in this building. In this building are ballparks, colleges, Costco's, yeah. you know, everything. You met your wife there. You had your children there in the hospital and the, you know, it, you hike and there's mountains in there. Right. Mountains, 500 miles. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, trains in there cars in there right. maybe even airplanes right? right 500 miles right so all of that's there but every time you start going towards the outside wall when you get within five miles of that wall they say no 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 you can't go any farther right why the penguins and the ice we got to protect we right. got to protect them well so, let, let, let's add another layer to that yeah. then there's warring factions inside of your building but they all agree that you can't yeah. fucking go yeah. to the edge well, of the building two things that they agree on <laughs> right. you can't go to the edge of the building and you need to get jabbed right okay yeah. the nazis they're allowed to go to the edge of the wall where there's doors right they find it fascinating why because there's more out there right, right? so you got a 500 mile building in the middle of the United States, let's just say, because this is just a smaller version. Right. So let's say the United States is the flat earth plane. Right. You got one 500 mile building that everyone lives in. And there's some people that know that there's doors to the outside mm -hmm. to more. Mm -hmm. Would you be fascinated with that? Yeah, absolutely. You, right. You can put I'd a tiger. <clears throat> if you put a tiger in um, you know, one acre yard fenced in, he'd be really pissed. Right. He'd be fenced. And then you put him in a 10 acre yard. He's still going to be pissed. Put him in a, 500 mile circle fence. He don't care. If he ever sees that fence, he'll just turn around and go back to where right. he was. No problem. Put a human in a 50,000 mile fence. He wants to go to the other side of that fence. Yeah. He wants to know what's on. I don't the, care how 100%. big it is. He wants to go to the other side of that fence. Right. I want to talk about 
the the North Pole now because that's another fascinating one as it relates to Mount Maru and that yeah. that whole thing. So the North Pole is there is something magnetic there. They say it's the Black Rock. Hmm. The Black Rock. The Black Rock. The Black yeah. Rock. Right. There's actually some video footage from an airplane or I think it was someone, a Russian airplane that showed us this the storm going around shows the wind currents and there's something sticking up through it, diverting the wind. Mm. It looks like the top of the, of the black rock mountain. Mm -hmm. No one's allowed to go to the North pole. I was shown a video in school as a kid to make me never want to go to the North pole. It was so horrible. These guys, their fingers are falling off. They're eating their dogs. You you know? yeah. yeah. And uh, w- w- you saw the thing did you were shown. No, no, the same- you brought, you yeah. brought up last night. You I brought, brought up- a really good point yeah. about this video. Yeah. And the video is to make any kid ever, never say, I want to go to the North pole. Right. But then after looking back at it and thinking with a real mind, it was totally staged. It was total stage nonsense. And um, it was literally to make you say you never want to go there. The North Pole and the South Pole are the, you know, the the alleged South Pole are the keys to figuring out that the Earth is flat. But you're not allowed to go there physically and you're not allowed to go there virtually. Right. On, uh, On Google Earth. Go to your the web version of Google Earth and get the measuring tool and draw a line around the United States. So a circle will tell you the square mileage. Do it around South America. Do it around Antarctica. Doesn't work. It inverts and becomes like a, a crescent moon going around the outside. Interesting. And do it around the North Pole. Same thing. It inverts. Do it around Greenland, Iceland. Works perfectly. Do it around the middle of the ocean. Works perfectly. Madagascar. Works perfectly. North Pole and South Pole inverts. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. 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 So there, yeah, there's, you know, it's interesting too, because people will say, Hey, you can literally go to the North Pole yourself on a guided expedition, or you can go to the South Pole yourself on a guided expedition. No, you can't. You can go to Antarctica. They take you to the ceremonial South Pole. There's a hundred different companies all run by the Antarctic commission. One guy owns all of the companies. They're all a bunch of shell companies. It's all tightly controlled. There is no independent exploration of Antarctica. People that are doing construction, working down there, um, you know, independent contractors, when they get south of 60 degrees south uh, parallel, they get boarded by a military group and they take over the helm of that ship. They're not even allowed to drive their own ship. Again, to emphasize this, the one thing that all countries of the world agree on and are at peace on is that Antarctica is not to be explored by anyone from their countries and independently. there's no independent exploration. Yeah. That's so sketchy. Like that is, that is so it's sketchy. All sketchy. To think about. It's all yeah, sketchy. It's all sketchy. Yeah. Okay. I, th- I think we've, we've hit all the major <laughs> points here now. We've been going for God knows how long. Um, last question I have. Why? Why does this even matter? Like, why what, what is? Matter? Yeah, why does it yeah. matter? That's the one that always that people always fall back on once they hear all these arguments. Like, it doesn't really matter. Again, it doesn't affect me in my day to day life. People will say, um, "Yeah, I, I guess I'll share like my brief anecdote on why it matters to me the shape of this realm." Because first off, like I'm in the pursuit of what is true, irrespective of what my preconceived notions were. And I'm just going to look towards that. Even if it flips my entire paradigm currently upside down, I'm going to just go and look again. When I had already come to understand the train-based health position, I was still a glober. I was, I was absolutely a glober. And now, like I said, I don't have any positive claims on what it is. I just know that there are countless examples of what they claim being demonstrably false. That's that's what I say. And then you have to fall back on, well, if it's there, the curve is falsified, then it's either way, way massively, massively larger than what they claim, or it's a flat. And there's also ways to show that the idea that we're spinning and things like this are demonstrably false. But the point is, I make no positive claims. But with that, for me, when you look at the idea that that We are not some speck floating in space amongst a bunch of a gazillion other specks. And it it lends credence to the idea that this was divinely created by a a God who has a great intention for our lives and like cares about us deeply. And I'm not saying that 
a God couldn't care about us with the other models. And I'm not saying that, you know, I didn't have a deep relationship with God when I was, when I bought the globe. But the point is, I look at the nature of this realm in a way where I, it, it, it like the only way it can make sense is that a divine creator created this realm who was intelligent and it didn't happen by accident and happened by chance. And this experience is just so much more meaningful from that lens. So we're born into God's world as um, inheritors of this realm. And immediately at birth, they, they trademark us, they stamp us, they commoditize us. And then they convince us that we don't live in this natural realm, that we live on a spinning ball, a satanic ball, right? If you look at all of the numbers, you know, the, the speed we're orbiting at 66,600 miles an hour, the curvature is six, six, sixty-six point six. you know, the, the latitude of a cancer and Capricorn is 66.6 degrees. It's so many 666s. It's freaky. Mm. It's beyond statistically possible. Um, if we are on, if if we play on their ball field, we have to play by their rules, right? If governments acknowledge that the earth is flat, then you have to acknowledge that there's a creator. You can't, there's zero flat earthers that don't know that there's a creator. Now we can talk all day about who the creator is, where the creator come from, what intentions, whatever. There is a creator. And if governments understood that there was a creator or abided by that, they would have to make laws that were in tune with natural law. But now because they live on their ball field with their fake money, they can, they can do whatever they want and we have to buy into it. You know, it's, I'm only one person. What could I do? You know, the, the big government, that's what they want you to believe that they have power. Imagine if everybody listened to this podcast in the world and they go, you know what? They're right. And everyone unplugged at the same time, governments wouldn't even exist anymore. We wouldn't even know who these people are. Right. They have no power other than the imagination and the fear of imagination, false evidence appearing real in our minds. Right. They don't want us to know that our thoughts create our reality. You know, we're in a magical world, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. It's amazing. On my app, the Flat Earth Summon and Zodiac Clock app, in the Frequently Asked Questions section, there's a section called Why the Lie? And there's a whole bunch of videos in there, but there's one of them that I want you to see. Uh, just um, look for Laura Nina, Why It Matters. It's a 10 minute video that you can't unsee once you see it. It's this woman in England that talked about what I was just talking about, but says it way more eloquently and has a prettier sounding voice. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Man, this has been such a fun conversation. Um, hopefully we covered all the relevant topics, but again, if there's something that we missed, just go check out Dave's app. It has everything categorized, easily searchable. You'll find all the answers to all your questions related to it, dissolving a cognitive dissonance. If you don't want to do the work, you can just keep believing in the ball. But knowing this takes time. I've been doing it since 2014. 24 hours a day. I dream it. I sleep it. I think it. I watch it. That's what I do all the time. And it's fascinating. I love it. Mm -hmm. Right. I work more than I've ever worked in my entire life, but I love it because you I would be it. doing this during my spare time if I had a regular job. Right. And it's because you have the childlike curiosity again, and you're able to sit in as you've shared multiple times during this episode. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is, but I just know whatever they say it is, it's very clearly not that. And from here we can explore creatively with childlike curiosity. Absolutely. FlatEarthDave.com. It's all there. Oh, we were going to talk about one thing. Um, Elon Musk. Yeah. Okay. Go to my website, FlatEarthDave.com. Scroll down until you see the Elon Musk banner, a whole bunch of pictures of Elon. Watch the five or seven minute video and then you'll know. Got it. Dave, thanks for joining me, man. This is awesome. Thanks, Alec. <laughs>